Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a woman who has had a very long and hard day at work. And she gets home, and in the evening, she goes and runs a bath. And she fills that bath with plenty of bubbles. And she lights a few candles around the bath. And she can smell the scents in the bathroom and notice the dim flickering lights around the walls of the bathroom. And she can hear that water running into the bath, filling that bath. And notice the steam in the bathroom and the mirror misting up. And then once the bath is full of bubbly, hot water, she gently relaxes herself down into that bath. Rests herself back. And relaxes all the way down so that she can feel the water just under her chin. She can feel the bubbles tickling as they touch and pop around her cheeks and around the back of her neck. And she can breathe in the fresh scents in the bathroom and hear the silence of that bathroom. And as she relaxes there, she allows her eyes to gently close. And she begins to just comfortably drift into her mind, drifting and floating into a pleasant reverie, where she starts to lose track of all time. Where she's aware that there's silence, but she's aware that there's a certain sound to the silence, but not a sound that she could pinpoint as hearing, that she would only be able to tell you that there was a sound by its absence if it disappeared. And she allows her mind to wander. And as she drifts deeper into that reverie, feeling the warmth of the bath, soothing and relaxing her muscles, soothing and relaxing her neck, her shoulders, her arms, her body, down her legs to her feet, relaxing her breathing, relaxing her heart rate as she drifts deeper and deeper into relaxation. She starts to have this sense in her mind's eye of walking through a forest. The sound of each footstep gently crunching on leaves and twigs, pushing through some of the thin, small branches weaving between the trees and walking deeper and deeper into this forest, noticing a slight fog hovering just above the ground. 
and hearing this musical sound off in the distance. A musical rhythm playing and with curiosity walking deeper into this forest towards that sound. And after a while, noticing that the fog is beginning to lift slightly as she approaches a clearing. And as she walks out into that clearing, she sees the strangest of sights. She sees a circle of different creatures. She can see a fox. She can see an owl. A couple of mice. Some squirrels all standing around in a circle, bobbing up and down. And in the middle of the circle, standing on a stone, on a grey and flat stone, and bopping up and down and dancing around. She can see a gerbil playing maracas and it's dancing around and twirling it's waving its arms in the air and all the other animals are standing around and bopping to that gerbil's music And then all of a sudden, one of those animals notices this woman standing there. And the gerbil drops their maracas. And all the animals start acting like normal. And start scampering off in different directions. As if what she had seen hadn't really been seen. And she walks over to that stone. And she can see that gerbil a little way off now, tucked behind a log, keeping an eye on her. She sits down near that stone, crosses her legs, becomes very still and quiet. And after a few moments, some of the animals poke their heads out and when they see that she isn't moving they start finding their way back and investigating her and that gerbil climbs up onto her leg and she remains motionless. And it looks up at her. And then she looks down towards it. And it flinches back ever so slightly. But then notices that she seems safe to be around. And so it moves forward again. And then she turns one of her hands palm up. And the gerbil moves over to that hand. And rests against the hand. And she gently strokes that gerbil. And then the others, all those other animals, start getting closer and start gathering around feeling that she seems safe.
And then that gerbil goes and picks its maracas up again and starts playing. Only this time, it's playing a different rhythm. And it's playing in front of this woman. And she finds it somehow hypnotic to be listening and watching that gerbil playing those maracas. And she finds her eyes doing a few rapid blinks before relaxing shut. She feels herself do one big breath in and then out. As she drifts even deeper inside her mind. And while she drifts deeper inside her mind, she starts having that feeling of wind blowing through her hair. And then a scene begins to form around her, of her traveling along in a car down an incredibly straight road where the road goes off so far in the distance that it reaches to at least the horizon. And she looks out of the window one side and can see the countryside flashing past. And she looks in towards the car, looking the other side. And in the passenger seat, she can see that gerbil with its seat belt on, shaking its maracas to the music on the radio. And it looks over and up at her and smiles, before getting even more invested in its playing. seeming so invested in the music that it closes its eyes to absorb itself in that music. And she looks back forward and continues to drive. And she doesn't even question the experience about going on a road trip with a gerbil. And as she continues to drive, so the sun begins to set. And eventually they have to set up camp. And she gets out of the car and can see in the back seat is a bag and she takes that bag off the back seat, finds a tent in the bag. She puts that tent up a little way off the road. She sees the gerbil take a bag and take a tiny tent out of that bag. And she watches as that gerbil puts its tent up next to hers. Then she heads into her tent, has a torch hanging down in the middle of the tent. And she sits in the entrance to the tent, with a campfire flickering away. And as the last of the sun disappears over the horizon, she can see the stars stretching across the sky. She looks over towards the gerbil, who looks back at her, and she can see it reclining on its back, lying there also looking up towards the sky. And she feels a connection with this gerbil 
like they're on this adventure together, even though they have no shared language. She feels that they understand each other. And they both head to bed in the tents for the night. And the next morning, they take the tents down, and they continue their drive. And the woman doesn't know where she's going, but she feels that they're supposed to both just be driving until arrival at the destination just feels right. She has this feeling like the gerbil knows where they should be heading. And part way through the day, she can see the most incredible clouds on the horizon, towering over the horizon. Almost like there's some kind of a smoke machine, bubbling those clouds out. And as she drives, so those clouds get nearer and nearer as she gets nearer and nearer to the clouds, until she can see in the distance a wall of rain And as they get closer and closer to that wall of rain, she notices the occasional raindrop landing on the windscreen of the car. And they make sure all the windows are done up on the car as they head into that rain. And there's a sound of the windscreen wipers flicking left and right, left and right, left and right. There's the sound of that rain on the roof of the car, on the bonnet, on the rear of the car, on the windscreen, on the windows. And as that rain gets heavier and heavier, so the woman decides to pull over at the side of the road and to stop for a while as visibility almost totally disappears. And she reclines her seat and closes her eyes and decides to just relax to the sound of the rain. And the gerbil just tucks itself down on the passenger seat and relaxes with the woman to the sound of that rain. And the woman wonders whether she's fallen asleep at points. When she starts to notice some hints of sunlight and starts to hear some distant sounds of birds. Sounds of birds that are almost chirping to celebrate the end of the rain. And then she notices off in the opposite direction to the sun, the most incredible vivid rainbow. and then continues her journey. And just as nightfall is setting in again, the gerbil changes its behaviour, as if to suggest that they're arriving at their destination. And the woman seems a turning off into a forest, 
The gerbil seems to be looking in that direction, so the woman takes that turning, heads down a dirt track into the forest. bumping through that mud, before arriving at a cabin deep in this forest. And the gerbil unbuckles its seatbelt, exits the car, heads into the cabin, and the woman follows. And on the floor, near the fire, is a tiny little bed. And the fire is a light. And that gerbil places its bag down near that bed and sits on the bed. The woman comes in and places her bag down near a chair. and sits down in the chair. And while sat down, she has a little look around. She wonders if there's anyone else here. And then she sees someone coming down some stairs, smiling, holding a hand out to greet her. She shakes hands with them as they then head through to the kitchen and then walk through a door. And a moment later, she sees that person walk in through the back door and greet her. And she thinks, I've just greeted you. And then she sees the other person come back through again and realises that these are twins. But there seems to be something different about them. And as they sit down and begin to talk to her, almost as if they both know what each other are thinking and saying, Almost like they have shared thoughts, like their sentences come from both of them, as if they're both one person. And the two of them smile and are friendly, and they share about how this gerbil has led her here. And that the gerbil and this woman will be heading out into the forest in the morning. But for now, they're here in this cabin. And then those twins lift up one hand each. They gently touch the palms of that hand together. And as they do, a white light begins to form around their hand, begins to spread out across both of their arms, around their bodies, until they're both totally contained within a glowing white light. And as that white light begins to fade. There's only one being stood there. And this being doesn't look like either of the twins. And they don't explain who they are and how they were as twins, or why. But as this single being
they hand the woman a single stone. And it's a very flat, very smooth, grey stone. And then they get surrounded by white light again. And as that white light clears, they're back to being the two twins, sat there as if nothing had happened, carrying on the conversation. And one of those twins says, I'll go and make up the bed for you. They head upstairs. And they make up that bed. The gerbil will sleep downstairs in front of the fire. And after eating, they head up to bed, curious about what the next day will bring. And the next morning, they wake up early and head off out of the cabin with that gerbil. And the gerbil, leading the way, leads them deep into the forest until they eventually find a stream and they follow that gently rippling, bubbling stream to a lake. And this lake is incredibly calm, with just the smallest of ripples. And the gerbil seems to be excited, jumping up and down and trying to draw attention to something. And they realise that that gerbil is drawing attention to something that's sticking out of the water. And it's sticking out of the water quite a long way away. And then the gerbil's making gestures as if it's suggesting to throw something. And so the woman takes that stone out of her pocket and asks, do you want me to throw this? And the gerbil seems to gesture as if to say yes, but is gesturing as if to say, but you need to hit that thing out there. And the woman isn't sure if she's going to be able to do it. And so she picks up some other stones first. She practices throwing those stones, skimming them to help them to travel further, to be able to hit the right mark. And once she was confident that she could do this, she took that stone, got down low over the water, and then launched that stone across the top of the water. And as it grazed the top of the water, she could see white sparkles coming from where it struck the water, almost seeming to propel it faster and each time it struck the water even more white sparkles appeared around that stone until eventually after about 10 bounces it struck the target and as it struck the target so she could suddenly hear a rumble and then could see the centre of the lake beginning to move, the water 
beginning to rise up, and a wave beginning to travel towards the shore. And then something broke the surface, and the water was pouring down the sides, pouring off the top. And there was a lot of mist of water. And that mist was catching a lot of the light. That low morning light. And making it very difficult to make out exactly what this was. And then, once the rumbling stopped, and whatever that was that came up from the water had stopped moving. She noticed that it looked like a statue of something. And she didn't know its significance. She didn't know whether she had to get to it. And if she had to get to it, couldn't she have just gone over to it and pressed that point instead of throwing a stone at it? And then she noticed that there was something swimming in this lake and saw that whatever had just happened seemed to have released some large manta rays into this lake, almost looking like shadows just under the surface. And she saw as one started heading over towards her and the gerbil. And as it got over near the shore, she recognised how large it was compared to her. And while she was so busy watching that manta ray swimming to the shore, she hadn't even noticed that the gerbil had changed into diving gear, including a tiny little helmet and some breathing apparatus. And by the time it got near the shore, that gerbil was already trying to run into the water and swim out to it. And she realised that in the bag that she had brought along was a tiny device she could pop in her mouth that would allow her to breathe underwater. So she took that device, popped it in her mouth, and walked into that cool water of the lake, and followed the gerbil to that manta ray. And the gerbil seemed to hold onto the back of the manta ray, and she joined it, holding onto the back, before that manta ray then began to descend into the darkness of the lake. And as it descended deeper and deeper, while swimming back in the direction of that statue, she noticed how much silt was down here in this lake and had been moved by what had just happened, and how this lake now almost took on a chocolatey colour that was very difficult to see through. And as they reached the point where that statue had risen up, she noticed that it seemed to have opened up a passage, and the manta ray dived down into the passage. And as it went deeper and deeper, so the woman had to make her ears pop a few times 
to remain comfortable while diving even deeper. And then diving through a passage before the manta ray stopped swimming and the woman realized that just above her head she could notice waves. She popped her head up and realized that she was in an underground chamber. And as her and the gerbil walked up into this chamber, it automatically sprung into light. And she noticed the scale of this chamber. And inside this chamber was the most beautiful blue lagoon. With water that was almost electric blue in colour. And the sound was so peaceful and echoing down here. And she followed that gerbil to the Blue Lagoon. And the gerbil walked around the edge of that blue water. And she followed it walking around that edge. And they arrived at a small rowboat. The gerbil jumped up and in, and she jumped in, and she rowed out into the lagoon, following the instructions of this gerbil. And she could sense the gerbil wanted her to stop when she was in the middle of the lagoon, and so she did. And as she stopped. That rowboat just bobbed gently up and down. The gerbil got out its maracas and started creating a rhythm. And the woman thought to herself, this probably isn't the time or place. But as it created that rhythm, she noticed movement from the top of the cave. Slight blue light moving, like thousands of particles of light moving from the top of that cave and seeming to flicker. And then after a few moments, she realized that she was now in a cave full of electric blue butterflies flying around her with some blue sparkling coming out the back and off the wings of each butterfly. And she watched as they seemed to dance around her and the gerbil. And then out of the center a tube started lowering down. And contained in that tube was a scroll. And she took that scroll out of the tube. She opened that scroll up and was surprised to realize that Somehow she instinctively knew what it said, and she knew that she didn't recognize the language, but she somehow, just from doing her best to read it, she could understand it. And she realized that it was teaching about the illusion of time, about the ability to slow time right down so much that a moment can last a lifetime 
It talked about being able to speed time right up. So a whole lifetime could pass in a moment. And how it could help you take a grasp of time. Help you be in control of time. Help you become a being that can transcend time. And the gerbil climbed up onto the woman's leg and read this scroll with her. And although she couldn't understand the gerbil, and the gerbil couldn't understand her, the two of them could understand this scroll. And she knew that somehow the knowledge from the scroll was becoming a part of who she is. Then the gerbil communicated to her to place that scroll back, that they've got their learning, they've come here for this knowledge, and she places that scroll back. And they row back across that blue lagoon. Those butterflies head back up to the top of this cave. And they find their way back to that cabin. And back at the cabin, they meet the twins. And the twins ask if they found what they came looking for. And the gerbil just climbs into bed, and the woman says that she thinks they did. And then that night, the woman heads to bed. And the next morning, they leave this cabin. The woman's still curious about those twins who can become a single being and whether the single being is the main being or whether the twins are the main being and what is going on with them. She's aware that they looked incredibly similar but there were subtle differences in the way they communicated. Almost like they're two sides of a coin. And she continued her road trip back the way she came. And at some point during the road trip, she found herself sat in that forest, surrounded by those woodland animals. Now, with a deer leaning over her. And they seemed so curious about her. And that gerbil started walking off into an area of the forest. The woman instinctively followed that gerbil. And she followed it through the forest, out to a clearing, where she saw the most incredible sight. She was looking over a field of sunflowers that stretched in every direction, all the way to the horizon, all the way off as far as she could see to the left, to the right. And she could see as that sun was setting over this sunflower field. And the gerbil climbed up one of the sunflowers to get a better look. 
and as that sun completely set over the horizon and the moon started shining in the sky. She had a sense of everything fading away, of smelling the scents in that bathroom, of feeling that tickling of the bubble bath and the warmth of the water, and hearing the relaxing sound the relaxing silence of the bathroom and opening her eyes in that bath, feeling so deeply relaxed. And then beginning to think about the experience And as she thought about the experience she just had, which she imagined was just a reverie, she had this feeling like somehow time was slowing down, like the flickering candles had more space between each flicker. And she moved one leg under the water. And she could see the way that moved the water, the way the bubbles bobbed up and down. And as she thought about time slowing down, she noticed that the bobbing waves in the bath seemed to slow right down. But she couldn't work out for sure whether that was a real thing, whether the waves really were slowing, or whether the water just happened to move at that speed. And after her bath, she wrapped up warm in a dressing gown. She sat outside on a bench looking out over her back garden. And she could see some fireflies flying between some trees at the end of her garden. She had this sense of slowing time down and noticed those fireflies become motionless at the end of the garden. And while she held on to that focus in her mind, she stood up and started walking towards those fireflies and realised that as long as she held her focus, they remained motionless. And then she had a sense of them moving faster. And while she watched those fireflies dancing and darting around, out of her peripheral vision, she suddenly noticed something else. The way the stars began spinning across the sky. And she stepped back a few paces and looked up at the sky while focusing on time going past quickly and could see those stars rapidly moving across the sky and realised that what she thought was just a reverie was more than just a reverie. And then she heard a noise and turned around and saw something scampering off and she headed back to her back door 
and on the ground at her back door was a little grey stone. And she picked that grey stone up. She could feel how smooth that stone was between her fingers. How smooth it was touching the palm of her hand. She headed into her home, closed the back door behind her, and sat comfortably down. And while she sat comfortably down, she focused on that stone, almost drifting into a meditation, thinking about the stone, thinking about her experience, wondering whether that was the gerbil that just came to her back door. Wondering who that gerbil was and where they are now and imagining in her mind's eye that they perhaps have gone off on another adventure, maybe with their backpack on, a little hat on, maybe to play music elsewhere. And that night, she headed to bed, still thinking about the experience, still trying to process this new learning about time and how time isn't a fixed thing, but is relative and can change depending on your perception. And as she thought about that, so she began to drift and float so comfortably and so peacefully asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And while you begin to drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this story about a man in a cabin in the woods. And this man has got his TV on in the corner of the cabin. He's got his fire in the fireplace crackling away. He's got a reading chair near that fire where he can keep warm, sit down and read. And on the floor in front of the fire is a cat. And that cat is just enjoying drifting, floating asleep with the warmth of that fire on their side, just warming their fur. While the man is in the kitchen area and he's just cooking himself some food. He's doing a bit of baking. And he's got his cookbook out and he's trying to follow the recipe. And all over the work surface and caked through the cookbook is flour. And some damp flour sticking to the pages. Where he's got his dirty fingers into that book. While he's trying to read it, kneading flour rolling the flour out and trying to make a cake and in the background the oven dings to let him know that it's reached the correct temperature and he slides the cake into the oven sets a timer washes his hands 
looks at the mess on the kitchen work surface and decides that he's going to just take a brief break. He can clean that up in a little bit. And he goes and sits down in that chair, picks the book up from beside him and begins to read. And as he reads, so he begins to relax. After the stress of trying to bake a cake, and a part of his mind keeps saying that he should just have gone and bought one. That it's a lot of effort to go to when you can buy one for cheaper than all the ingredients cost. And another voice in his mind says that he really wanted to make this cake. He's not really very good at baking, but he wanted to really give it a go. To see something that even if it didn't turn out perfect, he put everything together and it's his, it's what he made, and there'll be a certain charm to it. Rather than something that looks perfect, that has probably been made by machines. And this conversation goes on in his mind, between drawing his attention to sentences in the book. And as he finishes one sentence, so another begins, and he reads that, until he gets to the end of a chapter, to the end of the last sentence, and turns the page, and kind of drifts in his mind to the sounds around him, before he begins reading again, to hearing the sound of snow outside, where as the breeze blows, occasionally there'll be slightly stronger gusts of wind, and it'll sound like mice are throwing tiny snowballs at the glass, almost like mice are outside, trying to get attention to ask to come in. And he knows that as he begins to think like that, a smile begins to come to his face. Where he feels perhaps he's reading too many of these books. Giving animals personalities and turning them almost into human-like characters because he knows there are no mice out there standing in the snow, throwing tiny snowballs at his window. He knows it's just the wind, blowing the large snowflakes that are falling down, at the glass. And then as the wind relaxes, so, everything outside goes quiet again. And occasionally the fire will flicker and dance as some wind manages to blow down the chimney and catch that flame slightly. And the logs will crackle and pop. And the cat seems totally unfazed by all this. And the man looks at how long is left before the cake is done. And he sees that there isn't that long left now, perhaps just ten minutes. But no sooner has he looked at the time and the oven turns itself off, along with the lights, and he looks up at the light as if somehow 
that would do something and notices that there's obviously been a power cut. And occasionally in this remote location, in this cabin, in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, snow will gather on the lines and will manage to either short out a line and sometimes even get so heavy and turn very icy and bring lines down. And so he knows that he might have to wait a while. And he feels partly irritated that his cake isn't finished yet. And he leaves it in the oven and leaves the oven closed for now, feeling that perhaps the oven will still be very warm. Maybe it'll take a bit longer, but perhaps it'll totally cook. So he leaves that in the oven for now. He goes and gets some candles. And he's so used to his property, he can just walk around in the dark and feel very comfortable. And it isn't entirely dark. There's the glow from the fire. And he carefully walks around where the cat is resting on the mat. Aware that he can't really notice the cat in the dark. So he does that as carefully, gently as he can. Heads over, gets some candles, turns the candles on. Places them on the sides. Is surprised that the batteries in some of those candles are still working. And he thinks back to his childhood. To days when, where he grew up. Lights would sometimes go out. And in those days, you'd have to go and get wax candles and the feel of those candles. And you'd have to find a lighter or some matches. And you'd worry about those flames being around the house. But what if a candle fell over? And how much more convenient, at least short term, candles with batteries are. And that nowadays they come flickering, just like real candles, even though they're just battery powered. And so once he's turned on a bunch of candles around the room, he heads back to the chair and he finds that it's too dark to be able to read any more of his book. So he just sits there for a little while listening and relaxing, hearing the gentle sound of the snow gradually building up on the windowsill outside the windows. He can see the faintest glimmer of lights coming in through the windows, knowing that there's obviously a bit of light outside reflecting off clouds, maybe some moonlight managing to break through and bounce around outside on the snow, the white clouds. And so he just gazes out towards the window. And while resting there, he begins to notice tiny little points of light. And he watches and allows his eyes to focus beyond the window on those tiny points of light and realises that they're like tiny fireflies darting around, almost like fighter jets, sometimes flying in formation, other times darting at each other and spinning around up high and then coming down low sometimes just suddenly dropping and then stopping and almost hovering. Sometimes the light would go out for a moment and then come back on. And he watched with interest 
And as he watched with interest, so he could begin to really smell that cake. And he felt that maybe that cake is beginning to cook through fully. And he can't tell quite how long has passed. And he heads to the oven, he fills the oven, he feels the warmth of that oven. He decides to leave it just a little bit longer before checking on the cake. He doesn't know exactly when the lights will turn on, when the electric will come back on, or whether it'll even stay off all night long. And he thinks to himself how he'll know whether this cake is cooked when he can't see. So he grabs a knife from a kitchen drawer. He fills the blade of the knife with his fingertips to get an idea of what the knife feels like. He then goes to the oven, takes the cake out of the oven carefully places it down on the side and he can feel when he moves his hand near the cake the warmth given off by the cake and he rests the knife gently on top of that cake he hears the slight tap as the knife strikes that crust on the surface he applies the slightest of pressure and feels the knife pass through the top of the cake until he hears it thud at the bottom of the tin. He leaves it there just for a moment. He feels a slight tower of steam coming up from the hole created by the knife. He pulls that knife back out. And using his thumb and forefinger, he touches the blade of the knife again. And it feels dry and warm. And so he knows that, that cake is done. And he covers the cake. Goes and sits back down in the seat. And as he does, the cat awakens, jumps up on his lap. Purrs. Turns around on his lap. As if just changing position to drop back asleep. And falls asleep on his lap. And he strokes that cat gently while the cat drifts back asleep. And while he's sitting in the dark, with only the sound of the crackling fire, the dancing of the firelight, the light from those candles, the slight glow from outside the window, He appreciates the peace, the calmness of the environment. And that without anything to judge time by, he realises he's unable to tell whether an hour has passed, or two hours, or three hours. That the time just almost seems timeless. All he's aware is that it still looks like night time outside. Still a long way from the dawn. And he's not feeling tired. So he's aware that although he's deeply relaxed, it probably isn't bedtime just yet.
and he closes his eyes and begins to just drift into a meditation, decides to drift into a reverie, where he focuses his attention on the sounds he can hear. He thinks to himself, I can hear the crackling fire. I can hear the purring cats. I can hear the faintest sounds of the snowdrops, of those snowflakes on the window. I can hear the distant occasional rustling of the branches of the trees. I can hear the occasional sound from the oven as the oven is cooling down. He then focuses on things that he can see and he opens his eyes and holds his gaze out towards the window and lets his eyes defocus. And he thinks to himself, I can see those fireflies. I can see the flickering candlelight. I can see the dancing light of the fire. I can see the window frame. I can see dancing shadows. And he closes his eyes again and thinks of some things that he can feel. He thinks to himself, I can feel the warmth of the fire. I can feel the purring movement of the cat on my lap. I can feel my back against the chair. I can feel my feet resting on the floor. I can feel the air as I breathe in and out. And while he focuses on these things, so he notices the relaxation deepening. He notices his shoulders beginning to slump and relax further. He notices the voice in his mind quietening down and being focused on where he's focusing his attention. And he thinks to himself, I can smell that cake. And I can relax deeper. And as he thinks all this, so it's almost like everything around him is being turned down. Like his senses are being turned down. And as those senses are being turned down, so the senses in his mind begin to turn up. He finds himself more absorbed in an internal reverie, where he stops being so aware of the cat on his lap, of his motionless body, and begins to drift into that reverie where he finds himself in a cabin that looks surprisingly like his own on what looks like a warm summer's day. He finds himself standing up from the chair walking to the door leaving that cabin feeling the warmth of the sun on his face. Hearing sounds of frogs 
down by the lake. Sounds of some birds of prey flying overhead, circling and catching up drafts, rising higher and higher. feeling the breeze while he walks away from the cabin and heads towards the forest. And as he heads into this forest, so he notices how the atmosphere changes, almost like the air pressure changes as he walks into the forest. And he's aware that this is an unfamiliar forest. And yet something about it feels comforting and inviting. There's a certain softness to the sounds, to the feeling of each step that he takes, the way the sunlight dances through the canopy. And he walks deeper and deeper into this forest. And as he walks deeper into the forest, so he notices a red thread tied to a tree. And he sees that that thread seems to be tied from one tree to another, to another, to another. He decides to follow that thread and see where it leads. And at some points, there's a long distance between one tree and the next tree that the thread is tied around. And as he walks along, he lets that thread rest through the palm of his hand. And he can feel the feeling of that thread softly, almost tickling the underside of his hand while he walks, following the thread deeper into the forest. He notices that the thread takes a turn at one point down towards the ground, but it still seems taut so he knows it goes somewhere. And he moves the leaves, the branches from that point and notices how that thread seems to be heading down into some kind of a cave. And he has a, a mobile phone on him and he turns on the torch on the phone and heads down into that cave. And in the cave, he finds a bear. And it's a large, friendly looking bear. A bear with a red woolen jumper with the bottom half of the jumper missing and the thread leading to the jumper. And he wonders whether the bear tied that thread to that first tree or somehow got it caught on that first tree. and perhaps have been winding themselves through the woods to this hole in the ground. And this bear could be seen to be breathing so deeply, so comfortably, as they slept there in that red woolen jumper. And then another bear, a child 
aged bear, poked its head up from behind that bear, climbed over the bear, and introduced itself. And the man was surprised. The bear could talk. and talked with a childlike voice. And the man introduced himself back. And the man sat down, and this child bear began talking to him, began asking who he was, where he's from, does he want to play a game? Does he want to go on a bear hunt? Does he want to play hide and seek? Does he want to play I spy? What's his favourite childhood game? And the man tries to engage in this conversation, but feels uncomfortable around children, doesn't know quite what to say. And the man asks, do you know what happened to the other bear's jumper? And the bear responds, saying that that's his dad. And that he thought it'd be funny, he found a loose thread on his dad's jumper. He thought it'd be funny to tie it to a tree. And he wondered how long it would take his dad to notice. And he kept on saying to his dad, Oh, can you go and pick that mushroom for me? Can you go and pick that off of that tree for me? Could you go and get that for me? And he said that dad kept on going and doing these things, weaving himself through the trees, as his jumper was unravelling more and more. And the bear said he kept on wanting to snigger and laugh kept having to hold it back, wondering when his dad would notice. And then his dad got all the way back home and said it was time for bed. And he said he's not ready for bed yet, he wants to play. But he said his dad just lay down, closed his eyes, and fell asleep. And so he was sat there, twiddling his paws, wondering what he could do to amuse himself. And then the man had turned up. And he thought, maybe this man could amuse me. Maybe he'll play games with me. and that his dad doesn't seem to have noticed what's happened to his jumper yet. And so he hasn't had the fun of seeing his dad discover what's happened. And the man talks with the bear. And then the dad makes a few grumbling sounds, a few sounds almost like yawning and deep breathing. before waking up and almost appearing a bit startled by seeing this human sat there and then asks who he is and what he's doing there and in his deep and friendly voice engages in conversation and the man engages back in conversation And then the dad bear tells the child to go outside and gather some berries that they can eat together. And the child goes off out. And the man asks the bear whether he's noticed what happened to his jumper. And the bear said, of course I noticed. 
I noticed when I saw him tying the loose thread to a tree. But I thought it would be more fun to pretend that I didn't notice. And to have fun with his frustration of waiting for me to comment. And they engage in conversation until the child bear returns. And they sit and eat berries. And the whole time the man is aware that this is all still part of a reverie. That although it all feels very real to him, he knows that in reality he sat in the dark, meditating, drifting in a reverie, with a power cut going on around him. with a cat resting on his lap and the bear says, do you want to go out for a walk? I'll show you to a nearby place that my son really loves and he takes the jumper off tells his son what happened here? And the son responds with a snigger at what they've done. And he acts surprised. And the son seems to find this even more amusing. And he changes into a jacket. Before they head out, and start walking through this forest. And they follow a line of trees that seems incredibly straight, almost like they were planted on purpose. And the bear explains that this path has been laid down and walked by many generations of bears. That anything that builds up in this path, they keep it clear. And so it means that although this seems like it was made on purpose, it's just a natural outcome of the same route being taken year after year after year. And they head down to a water's edge. And near this water's edge is the smoothest, flattest stone that this man had ever seen. It looked almost polished. And the bear said that for generations they've come down here and they've sat and just listened to nature. And generations of bears sitting on that stone have shaped what it has become. And out of the jacket pocket the bear takes a coin And the bear says, Heads, you catch dinner. Tails, I'll catch dinner. And the bear flips the coin in the air. And the man watches as it spins. Then it lands and bounces on the stone. It spins around a few times. The bear places its paw over that coin, lifts its paw and its heads 
and the man thinks to himself, I don't know how to catch dinner. And the bear says, it's fine, you'll figure it out. We'll sit here and wait. You've got the river just running along there. I'm sure you'll be fine. Here, take this coin for good luck. And the bear hands the man the coin. And as he takes the coin and goes to put it in his pocket, he notices that its head's on both sides. And he sees the smirk on the child bear's face. He puts the coin in his pocket, heads to the river, can hear the rushing water where part of the river is fast and bubbly. Another part of the river is calm and smooth. And he wades out, he can feel the water above his knees. He bends his legs slightly and he remains still and focused. And he can see fish swimming around, swimming towards the flow of the river, almost hovering in position. And he just remains stationary where he is, and he carefully lowers his hands down into the water. So his hands are in line with his shins. He then moves his hands ever so slightly closer and just holds position and breathes and focuses and relaxes and just patiently waits. And the bears on the shore just patiently wait. And after a long time, a fish swims through his legs, between his hands. He manages to grab that fish and throw it over onto the shore. And he does this a couple more times with patience. And the bears are happy to eat them as they are. But the father bear decides, for the sake of this person, it'll be fun to camp so near the edge of the river. The father bear puts together a fire, lights that campfire, The father bear, the child bear, and the man then sit around that campfire. The bear says they'll do the cooking. So they cook up the food. And as they eat, so the father bear and the man almost drift into a philosophical discussion about space about time, about nature, about reality. About what animals think and feel. What animals can talk. And all the while the man is aware that this is still just their reverie, despite it feeling like many hours. In reality they feel, they bet that it's only been a short while, that the mind is incredible like that, that a long time can pass in a very short period of real world time, 
if you just allow yourself to be absorbed in that inner reality. And they'll have that fleeting thought, that connection to the reality they know is out there, before allowing themselves to place most of their focus on enjoying a meal with two bears. And after the meal, the man says that it's time for him to go, that he should find his way back, that there's a cabin just outside this forest, that that's where he started his journey. And they all say goodbye. The man finds his way back to that cabin as night time is setting in. He walks into the cabin. He sees that it looks incredibly familiar, sits down on that seat. He has a drink of the drink beside him. and then decides to rest back and start reading a book. And as he starts reading that book, so he starts to experience the strangest of things. The book seems to be getting larger and larger in his hands. And as the book is getting larger in his hands, so the chair that he sat in seems to be getting larger and larger. And then he realises that it's not that the book and the chair are getting larger and larger, it's that he is getting smaller and smaller. And while he's beginning to get smaller and smaller, so he notices little sparkles of light surrounding his body and that somehow he's getting smaller and smaller with his clothes also shrinking at the same rate that he's shrinking. Until he finds himself no larger than a matchbox, standing on what's now a chair, miles above the ground, where that ground looks so far down. He manages to climb over the edge of the chair, carefully climb himself down the material of the cushions on the chair, down to the chair leg, all the way down that chair leg to the floor. And from down here, he almost feels like he's in a land of giants. Where he feels like he can run for ages and yet barely traverse any of the floor. And he wonders what's going on here, why his mind has decided to encourage him to have this experience. He assumed he would read and drink a drink resting in that chair. And that that would almost be like a signal for him to revert back to the chair he's in in reality in his own cabin. But instead he seems to have gone deeper and deeper into the experience. Transition to a whole new experience. And he sees a tiny door in a floorboard. He goes over to it. He lifts up that door. And sees some steps. And he follows those steps down. And then climbs some steps the other side opens a door above his head and finds himself outside. 
and he turns and looks back at the size of the cabin. And he's aware that out here now is night time and the forest, the lake, everything looks as it did last time he was outside, except that it's night time. So he assumes he's in the same experience, just having a different experience within that same inner world. And he starts pushing his way through the grass that towers way over his head, heading down towards the lake edge. And down near that edge of the water, he can see moonlight glistening and dancing on what to him at this scale seem like large waves. But intellectually he knows these waves are actually quite small. They just seem large because of his perspective. And he has to keep convincing himself of that. And of making sure that he's safe where he needs to be. And then he notices a fern leaf floating by. He decides to climb onto that leaf. He has a stick in his hands, pushes off from the side, and just feels that it'd be an adventure to head out a little way, and it would be much quicker to be travelling on water than pushing through all that tall grass that's much higher than he is, or even walking on that mud, which is deep and sticky, but he's sure that his unconscious would only be giving him this experience, if there was some meaning behind it, and so, as he always tells himself, he should go with the flow, and so that's exactly what he does pushing away from the side, moving away far enough away from the shore that the waves don't keep pushing him back towards the shore, and then just allowing himself to go with the flow, to follow where the rhythms, the current of that water takes him. And as that water gradually moves him down and around the lake, with the leaf bobbing up and down. He just goes with the flow, relaxing back on the leaf, just occasionally pushing the water with the stick, just to make sure that he stays on track, but trusting that he'll end up where he's supposed to be. And as he travels along, so he begins to notice what look almost like orbs of light appearing and rising from the water. And they appear out of the water. Almost ethereal rising up into the air. And then after rising some distance, they seem to just vanish into thin air. And he tries really hard to follow with his eyes where these orbs are going, but each one just rises up and then vanishes. And he decides to steer himself a little closer to where most of the orbs seem to be coming from. But he can never quite seem to get there. And then after a while the tide just seems to take him over to a certain point on the bank. And so he allows it 
to push him up onto the bank. He walks along that fern leaf, climbs up onto the bank, walks away from the water a little bit, where all of a sudden, out of the dark, he spies a badger. And at first he's a little startled as this badger is enormous compared to him. But the badger reassures him. And he feels comfortable now talking with this badger. And he asks the badger about this strange land. About the talking bears, now there's a talking badger. And he asks about the orbs rising from the lake. And the badger explains that one night when the water has the right level of stillness and the moon transmits its silver twinkling glow at just the right angle, the fairies are born. They transition from underwater creatures almost like tiny mermaids. They almost become balls of light, balls of energy. It's like a cocoon that surrounds them. And as they transform inside that cocoon, they become lighter and lighter, not only brighter and brighter, but physically lighter and lighter. They become lighter than the water and then the light that surrounds them lifts them out of that water. They float up into the air until they reach a certain height where the air interacts with the light. And the light interacts with the night. And in an instant, the fairy bursts out of that light and the light disappears from around them. And a fairy is born and they fly up high into the sky where they can spread their wings in the moonlight. And the silver glow of the moonlight fills the veins in their wings with a special kind of energy that allows them to fly, allows them magical abilities and almost gives them a magical energy that's enhanced with the beating of those wings. And then they beat their wings high up in the sky, warming the wings, warming the fairies. And once they've done this, they head off down into the forest. And you can then find those fairies in the forest. where they can perform magic. They can help life grow in the forest. They help those that are lost and those that are trying to be found. And sometimes they help just by being the voice in the back of your mind, where they just come down beside you hovering by your ear. And they can talk verbally, but they can also communicate sounding like speech through the beat of their wings, beating their wings in certain rhythmic patterns that move the air around, replicating speech sounds 
almost like a deeper and lower voice. And so, between being able to communicate using their wings and communicate verbally, they're able to replicate almost any voice they feel will be helpful to you as an individual. And that most people just see the glow of the wings from the distance and assume that they're either silvery glowing butterflies flying in the sky, darting through flowers, darting through the leaves in the trees, or they catch that glow at night in the distance as fairies dance and interact with each other or just travelling from A to B, and they interpret it as fireflies. But those fairies are always there to help. And the badger explains that you're here, and you think this is just a reverie. But this is actually a deeper reality you're discovering that relates to your own reality, not just this reality in your mind. It's all representative. And the man doesn't fully understand, but on some level is aware that they can see a connection between the layout of this world in their mind and the reality. And they just feel that perhaps their mind just wasn't very creative in this instance, in this reverie, in creating the world their reverie was going to be in. Sometimes they drift into a reverie and it could be an alien planet. It could be in outer space, in a spaceship. It could even be floating in outer space as if they're some kind of superman able to fly in space without the need for any equipment. Or perhaps they're swimming underwater with dolphins, or with humpback whales. They usually find these reveries as so creative that they wondered why this world seemed so familiar and similar to their normal world where they've drifted into the reverie in. And then they ask how they're going to get back to their cabin. And the badger says that they can't really help themselves because they've got other things they need to be doing. But the frog can help. So they head to the frog and the frog says, I can take you back to the cabin. Just jump on my back. And so the man jumps on the frog's back and that frog begins to jump. And it leaps all the way back to that cabin. And the man holds on tight as the frog seems to bound its way across the grass until he can see the cabin. As he gets closer to the cabin, so he notices something strange occurring, that the weather near the cabin starts to change with each hop, that it goes from a summer's evening to him noticing snow around that cabin beginning to form and realising that it's almost as if that cabin and this reality are merging back together, as if he's beginning to get closer to his normal reality, beginning to drift out of this reverie. And as he closes in on the cabin, so he sees three mice, stood outside that cabin, 
throwing tiny snowballs up at the window. And he watches in amusement as they do that, before watching those mice scurry off when he's near to them. And the frog arrives at the door. And with the size that he is, he dismounts off the frog. The frog says goodbye and heads off again. And he's able to just duck down a little bit and squeeze under the door. He squeezes himself under that door into the cabin. And as he does, he notices this cabin is dark only lit with those electric candles and the fire and the moonlight shining in the windows and he can see himself resting in the chair and he heads over towards himself and as he does so he begins to get larger and larger until he's his normal size and he walks to where he is and he feels this sense of being somehow ethereal somehow not entirely physical and so he carefully backs himself up into himself lines his feet up with the feet of himself sat in that chair and carefully sits himself down into himself in that chair and then as himself in that chair he has this sense that that's what he's just done as he feels the warmth of the fire on his face he hears the slight whistling of wind outside the gentle tap of snow on the window pane he carefully moves his shoulders and opens his eyes, realises it's still very dark. He still has no idea of exactly how long has passed. And the cat's still asleep on his lap. And he carefully takes that cat off his lap, places it down in front of the fire again. He walks over to one of the windows rests his hand on the window and can feel that coolness passing through the window pane into the palm of his hand. He can feel the coolness from outside passing through the window onto his face as his face is near to that window. And he notices some flashes of light off in the distance. And notices a period of silence before hearing the low, gentle rumble of thunder. And realises that there's a distant thunderstorm within this snow. And he's heard about these thunder snowstorms before. Although he's never experienced one himself. And he keeps gazing out that window. At the distant flashes of light in the sky. Illuminating the clouds. Followed by that low rumble of thunder in the distance. And then after a while, his lights turn themselves on. He hears everything resetting and turning on after the power cut. The cat pops its head up with the sudden light before closing its eyes again and drifting back asleep. The man sees that it's now beginning to get very late, that he should head to bed.
So no sooner has he finished meditating and relaxing and the lights have only just come on, and he decides to turn it all off again. He makes sure the cake is covered and looks forward to eating some of that tomorrow. He makes sure that the fire is just embers and is perfectly safe. Just to have the slightest warmth in the cabin while he sleeps and he heads off to bed and as he drifts and floats asleep in bed so he recalls his reverie he tries to work out its meaning of both parts of that reverie of the encounter with the bears, of the encounter with that badger. And other aspects of that reverie, he knows that when he has reveries that are automatic, where he's just going along with that reverie, enjoying where it takes him, just going with the flow. He knows that it's his unconscious mind teaching him something, updating his mind with new ways of being, new ways of responding, things that he wants to work on, that maybe he doesn't consciously know the answers for. But he finds himself trying to work it out anyway, as he drifts and floats asleep. And while he drifts and floats into a dream, so he can still occasionally hear that slight rumble of thunder in the distance. He's aware the storm isn't getting any closer, but he notices that the snow begins to transition firstly into sleet and then into rain. And he finds while lying in a warm, comfortable bed, with the sound of rain on the window, that distant, gentle, deep rumble of thunder, that something about that just helps him drift even deeper and feel even more relaxed in the experience of falling asleep. And he's curious about the fairies, whether there's more to the fairies, more to the experience, than he realised. He remembers seeing what he thought looked like fireflies before he drifted into his reverie, and wonders whether they were fireflies, or whether his mind is aware that fairies are real out there somewhere. And that magic, perhaps, does exist. And isn't just something in stories and in your mind. Or whether maybe he reads too many books. And sometimes prefers to drift in those inner stories. And while he drifts asleep. So he finds himself walking through a land where his mind interprets the thunder in the distance as being a volcano he can see off in the distance murmuring gently just rumbling away with the occasional puff of smoke and spitting of lava And he looks around this dreamland he's drifting into. He sees a raven in a tree. Just watching over him. Making sure he's safe and well. And then he sees a green fairy fly down in front of him. And he notices 
her piercing green eyes, and the way that silver sparkles seem to emanate from the fairy's wings as they move so fast, the wings themselves almost just look like a blur. But every movement, every slight dart from one location to another leaves a small trail of silver sparkles that gradually fade. And the fairy talks with their voice and their wings almost like a united voice that passes into his mind, into his body, and communicates with him a connection between his inner world and the outer world, and that he should believe in magic. And as he thinks about the idea of believing in magic, a bear hands him their leather jacket. He climbs on a motorbike. And while thinking of believing in magic and drifting deeper and deeper asleep, knowing he'll awaken in the morning, feeling so refreshed and revitalized and full of energy, having made some inner changes, he decides to go on an adventure, go on a journey to that volcano, a journey of deep inner discovery, unsure what this journey will entail. And as he cycles off on that motorbike, he drifts deeper and deeper into the most peaceful, most comfortable sleep. So, just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell a story in the background. And while I tell this story, you can begin to just comfortably drift asleep. And as you drift asleep, you can have a sense of walking through a forest one night. And it's a deep and dark enchanted forest. And through the trees, you can notice spots of light flying around, noticing the twinkling trails left behind those spots of light, whizzing and weaving through those trees. That slight sound of buzzing as they pass near you, noticing that some of those Creatures that pass you by have wings and then recognising that they're small fairies, that there are green fairies, purple fairies, pink fairies, red fairies, all glowing different colours, all seeming to go about different jobs in this forest. And as you continue walking through this enchanted forest, listening to the slight rustling and crunching sound of each footstep that you take, hearing the rustling leaves overhead in the trees as the wind blows a breeze, noticing the occasional shard of moonlight managing to pass through the canopy and dance in front of you, illuminating the occasional bit of dust kicked up in the forest. 
and noticing the flowers in this forest. That with the slightest touch of your feet, the grass seems to glow and the breeze blows across the grass. And as it does, so you notice this wave of green glow passing across the carpet of the forest. Noticing some glowing purple flowers and perhaps other flowers in this forest. And you can hear some of those sounds in the forest of different animals, aware of large deer in the distance, and you walk your way through the forest, you find your way out of that forest into a clearing, finding yourself in a clearing, in a meadow, up on a hill. And you follow a path out of the forest, down that hill, into a valley below. Looking around and seeing the waves of green glow as the wind blows across the meadow. Seeing the stars arching overhead. Seeing the way the moonlight is glistening on a distant river that passes through the valley. And so you walk yourself away from the forest, down that hill, through that meadow, down to the valley, walking down towards that river. And as you arrive at the river, so you have a kayak that you left here previously. You push that out into the water, climb into it, and begin to paddle down the river. And as you paddle, you can hear the sounds of the oar in the water on one side, then the other. And feel the sense of pushing yourself forward. Feeling the way that kayak moves through the water. And after some time, you reach as far as you can go. You pull the kayak in onto the other side of the shore. You disembark, drag it up onto the shore. And you continue walking along near the river before turning away from the river heading up some more hills as the night continues on and you head up some hills up near another forest and you know this is where you want to stop for the night so you set up tent, you make yourself a campfire near your tent, you light that campfire, you have yourself something to eat, and you sit down just in the doorway 
of the tent. Listening to the crackling fire. Noting the way the light dances around the grass. The warmth of that fire just warming your cheeks as you feel a sense of drifting and relaxing deeper. And then resting back in the entrance to the tent, gazing up at the sky. And having this sense almost of floating out of your body, of floating up into that sky, drifting and floating higher and higher, finding yourself absorbed in space. And while you're absorbed in space, so you begin to almost psychically or mentally travel through the stars. Almost like traveling on the magnetic field lines and the energy that connects everything in the universe. having the energy that makes up you traveling through the magnetic field lines of the earth into the magnetic field lines of the sun at the point where they interact and then at the speed of light traveling on those magnetic field lines all the way to the edge of the solar system in connecting with magnetic field lines from the galaxy and then beginning to traverse the galaxy on those magnetic field lines flying through nebula noticing the colors, noticing stars springing to life like silent explosions of light and movement. Traveling near the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Noticing the way that time seems to stretch. That the perception of everything stretches out curves around you, that every moment in the past, present and future is suddenly visible all at once, and then travelling down into the centre of that black hole. and feeling a sense of time standing still, almost like a ticking clock stopping and only noticing that it was ticking at the point it stopped. Only noticing that it was ticking at the point the talk stopped and finding yourself floating where there's no up, no down, no left, no right, no backward or forward, where there just is, where there's no sound. no light, just comfort, peace, and then in a flash you find yourself 
in what looks like a universe that just doesn't look like your own. As if you've just come out of a portal through universes. And as you look around, so you notice how familiar it feels, yet knowing you've never seen it before. In the same way that you can see a forest, and it'll be familiar, you know it's a forest, but at the same time, you can know you've never seen that bit of forest before. And at the speed of light, you continue to explore with consciousness spreading, following the magnetic lines of different stars black holes, different galaxies, jumping from one magnetic field line to another. Where you know you're traveling at the speed of light, and yet everything seems so slow around you. And then you begin to get this sense that you've experienced this for a reason. And you begin to wonder whether this actually is some kind of genuine experience, not just a dream. You laid down, you gazed up at the sky. And then you started having this experience. And out of curiosity, you went with the experience. In the same way that you can just drift into a dream. But now there's something about it. That makes you question whether it's a dream. Because you find that you're approaching what looks a bit like a blue marble in the sky. And as you get nearer and nearer, so you notice how similar it is to Earth. And yet you're aware that it's also different. And you find yourself on that planet. And you land on that planet in a lush green area. And you look around you and it's lush, it's green, but you can't see any animals. And as a consciousness, you leap off that lush green area. You focus on the idea of life. And you land in a desert. And you look around you, curious. You are focusing on life and here you are in a desert. And you can see a distant sandstorm whirling up and beginning to spread. You can see some mini spirals of sand dancing across the dunes. 
and you travel across those dunes. Having that sense that you can smell water. And you allow yourself to just instinctively be drawn to that sense. And while you're being drawn, a part of you is thinking it can't be possible because of all this sand. And then you see a single tree standing in the middle of this desert. And the tree looks so healthy and out of place. You walk over to the tree. You touch the tree with your hand. You feel the bark of that tree. You tap on the tree. And you notice something unusual about how it sounds. And as you tap on that tree, you notice there's an area on the tree that sounds a little hollow. So you tap around that area, until eventually you notice there's an area to push on the bark. And when you push it, so an entrance opens and you see a spiral staircase leading down under that tree. You walk through that entrance, the door shuts behind you. You follow that spiral staircase deep down under this tree. You notice the smell of water getting stronger and stronger. and find yourself in a cave system. And there are lights down here in this cave system. And there are areas where the cave is darker and seems to be just illuminated by glowing moss. And there's the sound of dripping, flowing, running water. And the murmur of life. And you explore the cave. And you find there's an entire civilization down here. And as you explore and discover that civilization, they're startled to see you. Because you look different to how they look. And one of them comes over to you and tries to communicate and you don't understand what they say. And so they start using gestures to try and explain. And you grasp that they'd like you to follow them. And you follow them to what looks like a palace. With pillars outside that palace. Holding up a grand ceiling. And you can see what looks like a painting on the ceiling that's perhaps telling the story of these people. And you walk in and your footsteps echo and reverberate around this palace. And you get showed to someone who looks like they're in charge. And this person comes over to you 
curiously. They greet themselves. And you don't understand what they say, and they can't understand you. And then they direct you to a seat. They go to a small fountain of water. They get some of that water from that fountain. And as they bring it over, you notice that the water has an electric blue colour to it. And they offer you some of that water. And you take a sip. And they gesture to have the cup back. And then they take a sip. And then they put that cup down and they sit expectantly and watch. And you feel that cold water pass down your throat, down into your stomach, and then you feel it spreading around your body. And you feel a tingling passing to your mind, through your head, all the way down to the tips of your toes. And you can notice that they seem to be experiencing the same. And then they open their mouth and start to talk. And you understand them. And you reply to let them know you can understand them. And they let you know they can understand you. And they tell you that this water from this fountain can connect all life, can help all life communicate with each other. And it only lasts while that water is passing through you. And they wonder where you're from. And you explain that you're sitting in your land back on a different planet and while you were back on that different planet you started gazing up into the sky and somehow managed to get projected through space and time finding yourself in another universe finding yourself on another planet finding yourself here and then you were drawn in by the smell of the water. And they explained that long ago there was some big events that happened on this planet. Much of the water on the surface was lost. There are some places where there's still water on the surface. But much of the water was lost. And so they followed the water and they built these underground cities in the caves where the most water was. And they sought out the healing water and followed the electric blue healing water springs. And they were curious why you would be here. And while they talked, they gestured for someone to come over. They asked that being to go and get some drinks. And the being came back with what you would describe as perhaps a teapot and some cups. And they poured some glowing warm green drinks. They took a drink of their drink and gestured for you to do the same. And as you put it near your nose, you could smell how sweet it smelt. You took a sip of it and could taste that sweetness and feel the warmth and that warm tingling 
that seem to pass through your body, up the back of your neck and through your head, and around your cheeks, and then down to your fingertips, and then a sudden wave of deep relaxation. And you didn't know why you were here, and neither did they, but somehow your two worlds have been brought together. And you communicate for a while longer, before they say they've got something for you, that they just feel that this is something you should have. And they don't know what you'll do with it. They don't know whether it's something you can take back with you. But they want to give it to you anyway. And they go and grab you. The most beautiful, perfect glass. And you would describe it probably as a wine glass. But they give you that most beautiful, perfect glass. And they tell you there's more to it than just being something to drink out of. That when they found this place and they set it up, the first two people here drunk from this glass and one just like it. And they've never met anyone from another world. And they've saved these two glasses as a symbol of keeping the civilization going. And they feel this event is equally as big that it demonstrates there's more out there than just the life here. And you wonder if there's anything that you can hand them. And you know that you're only here really as consciousness. And yet you feel physical. You feel around your pocket. And you find a silk handkerchief. And you know that you had that on you while lying down at the tent. And you don't know if it's even real being here as consciousness. But it is in your pocket. So you take it out your pocket. And you hand them that silk handkerchief. And they feel how smooth that is. They notice the way that it moves in their fingertips. And it's lightness. And you find your way back out of the cave system. And head back out into that desert. And as you do, you begin to think about going home. And you find yourself making that journey back the way you came. Passing back through space and time, back through that universe. Back towards where that matter seemed to be coming out of. You find your way back in. And for a time you're in that space where there's no up, no down, no left, no right. No backward or forward. No sound. Just peace and silence. And then after a moment, in a flash, you find yourself back in your own galaxy. Travelling through your galaxy. Feeling drawn home. 
and then you can see that blue marble. You hurtle towards the blue marble. And then slow down and you can see yourself down there. Relaxing, gazing up into space. And you float down into that you. And just as you do, that glass falls from your hand onto the grass and rolls a little bit on the grass. And you suddenly become aware of being you there at the tent with the crackling fire, the dancing lights, the stars overhead. And realise you've got the glass with you and you check your pocket and realise you don't have your silk handkerchief. And the experience is a little confusing. You don't know how you did that. Whether you could do that again. How you left your body. While still being connected to your physical body. Almost like somehow you travelled as a physical being through consciousness. And while you wonder about that, you hear the distant grumble. of a dragon flying overhead, the pounding of its wings. You wonder whether it's finding somewhere safe to go, perhaps aware that the weather's on the turn. You then hear the distant rumble of thunder and you can't see any rain and you can't notice any clouds in the sky but you can hear the distant rumble of thunder and then as you continue to relax you notice the sky in one direction occasionally flashing with some light before hearing that low, distant rumble of thunder. And you have this sense that you know that there's a storm just gently working its way in. And you feel like it'll be perfectly fine. You know there are much taller things around you. You are nearish to the tree line, but not in reach of any falling trees, and hopefully not in reach of any jumping lightning. And all the trees are much taller than you are. And you're aware that your tent is perfectly fine in thunderstorms. Its ability to work like a Faraday cage if needed is one of the reasons why you chose this tent. Because you're always thinking of any eventuality. It's always best to be prepared. And so you know that you'll be able to just relax back in the tent as that storm gets nearer. And you'll be able to just enjoy the storm passing over. And you've been gone for a few days, out on a journey, over to the most enchanted forest. You had to go and meet with a wise person 
in that forest. And now you're making your journey home. And you enjoy this land. So you don't mind taking a few days and relaxing and ambling your way home. And then you notice a large raindrop splat on your head. You know that those clouds are now getting closer. And so you tuck yourself away in the tent. You seal up the tent. You relax back so comfortably and peacefully in that tent. The glow from the moon on the outside of the tent, gradually fading as the clouds move in. As you now hear the larger raindrops hitting that tent, and then that rain gradually getting heavier and heavier on the outside of the tent, and you lie back in that tent, beginning to drift and flow to sleep, and you try really hard to stay awake, to try and hear and enjoy the sound of that rain on the tent, to hear and enjoy the rumble of thunder. And you notice the way the thunder is the kind of thunder that just rumbles gently and deeply, rather than cracking loud. And you notice flashes through the tent that illuminate the raindrops on the outside of the tent and the rain that's running down the tent. And you enjoy the sound of that rain outside, finding yourself unable to keep your eyes open, almost like the rain is hypnotic, that the pitter-patter of that rain is somehow guiding, relaxing you asleep deeper and deeper. And while it does, You find that you drift into a pleasant reverie. You drift into a pleasant dream. And you wonder what the dream means. You dream of being at home, watering your plants. going into the living room, your dog running up, excited to see you back in the room, as if perhaps you've been gone for days, when you just went outside and watered some plants. And you stroke the dog, and pat the side of the dog, and sit down and relax, as they rest next to you, resting their head on you, feeling the warmth of their body, with your hand resting on the side of their chest, aware of their breathing in and out. And just gazing out over the back garden, through a window. And you dream about being at home. And you think this is a nice, relaxed, mundane dream. There's not a lot going on here. And then you notice the tree at the back of the back garden and realise that the leaves on the tree turn into small flames. 
and then that spreads to the branches and it spreads to the trunk and then that tree and the trunk shrink down to ash and you stand up and go to the back window and you gaze out over that garden seeing that tree burnt down to ash Noticing those embers at the back of the back garden. The occasional flames dancing up. The glowing of those embers. The dark trails. Into the sky from the fire. And a slight movement among those embers. And then noticing a golden phoenix rising up out of those ashes. Launching itself up into the sky. Flexing its wings, flapping them. And then flying off. And with that, you wake up in that tent and realise that it's morning. And you can hear songbirds of the morning. And you can notice the way the sun's shining on the outside of the tent. And as you open the tent, you can notice the mist across the grass. As the sun is warming, the rain from the night before and it's evaporating. You pack up the tent, you continue your journey home. You walk down to the village. And as you arrive at the village, people greet you, welcome you back. People seem excited to see you. You make your way home, your dog is excited to see you, wagging their tail, jumping up at you. You put your things down. You make yourself something to drink, you sit down and drink that drink. And as you do, you gaze out into the back garden and notice that the tree at the end of the garden has disappeared. And you walk down to the end of the garden and you just see the ash at the end of the garden. And you realise that it was more than just a dream. You can see the signs of where that phoenix rose from the ashes. And you become aware that there must have been a phoenix egg in that tree. That phoenixes lay eggs. And those eggs grow larger over time. But they lay the egg within the base of a tree. And the egg as they lay it is squishy and so it squeezes into a tree and then it starts to solidify and it takes years for an egg to develop and as the egg develops so the phoenix inside the egg grows larger and larger and then when the phoenix is almost at the point of bursting out of the egg, it begins to warm its body up. And that warms up the surrounding shell. And that shell warms up the tree until it reaches a point where that warmth 
begins to initially start spreading through the tree until the tree begins to combust and almost just burst into flames. And then those ashes free that phoenix to burst out of the egg and go about its life. And you'd heard about Phoenix being able to almost create a psychic connection. You wonder if somehow your experience has created a connection with that Phoenix. Maybe there was still some of that blue water within you. And you head back into your home and you get a book off the shelf and you begin to research about phoenixes and you learn that what you thought of as an egg is more like a cocoon that's formed around that phoenix and you continue to read and learn And you find that being long term in the psychic area of a phoenix creates a connection. That while they're forming, they're sending out and creating a lot of energy that's what's going to set fire to the tree, but in doing so, animals that have been in their area receive a warning of this, for them to keep away from that area, and you realise that all your time living with it in your back garden, it must have created that connection and perhaps triggered your experiences and your ability that until last night you didn't know you had. And the wise person that you'd been to see was about a completely different issue that you'd encountered. that you'd been having a problem in your garden with some rogue fireflies and so you'd had to travel to the enchanted forest go and see that wise one to receive something from them that would help you to deal with the fireflies and you were told that you needed to hang a braid of hair in the tree in the back garden and that that would make the fireflies stay away as that braid of hair flaps and moves in the wind but now the tree isn't there but you go out into the garden anyway you hang a braid of your hair near where the tree once stood. You don't know if the fireflies will be a problem again. Or if perhaps they were just disorientated by the heating of the tree. And you spend the rest of your day with the dog. You make the most of the day having not seen your dog for a while. And 
you sit in your garden, watching the birds in the garden, the butterflies, other insects. Enjoying a drink in the garden. And as you relax in your garden, so you start to contemplate the meaning of the experience. You've read in the book that a connection is created between you and that phoenix. And that the phoenix will be back. And you know that phoenixes are rare. That any one phoenix. Is only around in one area for a while. They keep distance from each other. It takes years for them to be born. And so you wonder whether that phoenix will be back. And if it will, what your experience will be. And as night draws in and you can see the moon rising in the sky. And the stars in the sky. You sit in your back garden. You have a drink out of that glass, gazing up at the sky, thinking about those other aliens out there, those other beings out there somewhere, in an entirely different universe, wondering whether you'll be able to replicate whatever it is you did before perhaps even take control of that ability and learn how to do more with it and learn more about it and after you've drunk that drink you wash up the glass you head up to bed the dog comes up with you dog gets into its bed near yours. You head to bed. You begin to drift and float comfortably and relax to sleep. And as you drift asleep, so you drift deeply and pleasantly into a dream and notice that this is the first dream of many that seem to bring so much pleasure and deep comfort and begin to teach you how to use these skills, how to focus on these abilities. And you begin in each dream to realize that subtle connection with the phoenix, aware that it's trying to communicate with you from afar and that it will be back, and that you know you'll see it again, you'll use these skills again. And you know that you and your dog will probably have to go on many adventures through this land. You just have this sense that there's more to come. As you comfortably and deeply drift asleep. So take a moment to get yourself comfortable, allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can begin to relax. And as you relax, 
I don't know whether you will fall asleep faster with the sound of my words, or with the spaces between my words, or whether it'll be with each outbreath that you take. And as you begin to drift comfortably asleep, so I'm just going to tell this story in the background. And the story is about a man driving along a road through some forest. And there are tall trees either side, stretching off into the distance of dense forest. And he's just driving along this incredibly straight road, cutting through this forest. And he's been driving for some time along this road with those tall trees just passing him by on either side with just the sounds of the car as it sticks to one speed driving along the windows wound down sounds of birds the sound of air passing the sides of the car. Seeing just the area of sky above and in front of him. Noticing its blueness. As he drives along, hearing the sound, the car makes on the road, on such a smooth and straight road, and after a while eventually the man reaches a fork in the road, and he pulls up at that fork in the road and begins to think about which route he should take. He isn't going anywhere specific. He's just exploring and finding somewhere to camp out in these forests. And so he's just following his heart, following his gut feelings. And he decides to turn left. And he follows that road left continues along that incredibly straight road until eventually he finds a turning off into the forest and it's a turning on to a muddy track and so he takes that turning drives down that muddy track the car bouncing along the track thinking to himself how lucky he is that he's got good suspension as that car drives down that track and while the car drives down the track deeper and deeper into the forest so he notices that the light dims around him and the sounds of the birds increases And his car works its way down that track. With the wheels occasionally slipping on the mud. But generally doing okay at working down that track. Deeper and deeper into the forest. And the man doesn't know his exact location. He's not interested at this moment in knowing his exact location. He's more interested in finding somewhere secluded that he can camp for the night and have a bit of solitude, a bit of time away from the hustle and bustle of the nearby city. And so he 
continues along that track until eventually he can notice that ahead is getting lighter. More sunlight is obviously shining in. And as he gets closer to that lightness, he notices that it's opening out into a clearing around a lake. And so he drives his car out into that clearing, pulls the car off the track, around by the tree line. He gets out his car, goes round to the boot, opens the boot, takes out a tent, and he finds a location a little bit back from the lake, a little bit higher up, and pitches the tent there. And once he's pitched the tent, so he digs a pit in front of the tent, just a shallow pit to build a fire in. He uses some rocks, then some wood, and then some small bits of finely cut wood that he lights to start that fire. And with a crackling and a popping, that fire starts and catches the larger bits of wood alight, helping to keep that fire going. He then sits back from the fire, just inside the tent, and he relaxes back onto his elbows, lying back onto his elbows, just taking a moment, and he listens to the crackling fire. And he gazes up at the sky. And he breathes calmly and peacefully. And takes a moment of relaxation for himself. And after a moment's relaxation, he continues getting himself sorted getting his campsite set up how he wants it. He's aware that the sun is going to be beginning to set soon. So he goes and gets the last of his gear from his car, puts it into his tent, makes his tent cosy, and comfortable and a relaxing space to camp. He hangs a torch up inside the tent, ready for when it starts to get dark. He goes and finds a thick branch and pulls it over near the campfire for something to sit on. He's happy to sit in the tent, but he's aware that he might like to sit outside the tent, sitting by the fire. And he sets up a structure around the fire that he can cook some food on, that he can rest a pot on top of, to cook some food over the fire. And as the sun sets, so he notices the way the light glistens and sparkles on the lake. 
and notices the way the lake is beginning to take on an inky look. As the sky turns darker, initially with some oranges and reds, as that sun sets, and he cooks himself some food, sitting by that fire, and he eats that food and he notices as the sun sets that the temperature drops a little as well, so he wraps up warm by the fire, eating that food he's just cooked, hearing the sound of crickets and other nighttime sounds, the sounds of bats flying around overhead. He notices how the birds quieten down, with just the occasional bird from time to time making a noise. And how it's almost like his sense of hearing increases in sensitivity that he can hear the rustling of the leaves, of the trees, the gentle sloshing of the water of the lake on the shore, the occasional sounds of little animals scurrying around, perhaps going down to the water's edge for a drink, the occasional splash from out in the water where maybe a fish has popped up above the surface for a moment. And he notices as the sun fully sets over the horizon, the stars in the sky twinkling, sparkling overhead, the Milky Way stretching beautifully across the sky, and he relaxes back into his tent, relaxing down in his tent, not to fall asleep just yet, but just to be comfortable and cosy, while enjoying the peace and the experience. And after a while of enjoying the peace and the experience, the fire begins to burn down to embers. He can still feel some of that warmth coming off the fire. And he turns on the torch, closes the tent, and he can hear the movement of the walls of the tent in the breeze. and yet feels so calm and relaxed inside the tent. Just relaxing inside the tent and drifting and floating comfortably asleep. And the next day he wakes up feeling so refreshed, peaceful and calm. He unzips the tent He can still see a little bit of smoke rising from the fire. He takes some deep breaths of the fresh air, walks down to the lake, splashes some of the water on his face, feeling the coolness of that water. And decides to Go and explore today. And with curiosity, he wanders around the lake. And he follows that lake all the way round. To a large tree. And this large tree is near the lake and set away from the rest of the forest. 
and the tree doesn't look like the other trees. It's taller and it looks like it's been here a lot longer. And he reaches out and touches the bark of the tree, runs his fingers around that bark. And then he notices that he can climb up a little way, so he climbs up the tree to the first branches and he sees that the centre of the tree appears to be hollow and unusually for a tree there seems to be a ladder heading down the inside of the tree and so he shimmies over to the centre of the tree shimmies over to the trunk and squeezes himself inside that trunk and descends the ladder. And once he's descended lower than the tree, suddenly everything opens up really wide as he enters a cavern deep under this tree and he continues to descend down to the cavern floor. And once at the cavern floor, he gets his phone out and shines the torch around this cavern. And he can see that there's water flowing in from the lake through an underground passageway creating a waterfall down here in the cavern and a river that that waterfall's flowing into and he follows that river deeper and deeper underground in this cavern and in the distance he can hear the sound of drumming and he continues to follow the river going deeper and deeper and the further he gets away from the waterfall the calmer that river becomes and the calmer the river becomes the more he notices it widens until eventually he arrives at a cavern where the water is like a lake in the middle of this part of the cavern. And around the other side of the lake, he can see somebody playing a drum. And he walks around the lake towards the person, and they don't seem phased by him being there. They just continue to play. And this person appears to be part man, part bull, where the lower half of their body is like the front part of a bull. As if they've got the legs of a bull and the torso and the head of a human. And they just sat there playing a drum. And he walks up to them with curiosity. And he asks them who they are, where this place is, why they're here. And they say who they are and that this is where they live that they travel out at night because their eyes struggle with the bright daylight and that the way in that the man took is really more of an emergency exit or just some way of keeping the air circulating there's actually an alternative route 
into this cavern. And they live down here in this cavern. They occupy themselves playing their drum. And they seemed incredibly friendly, and the two of them spoke for a while. And this person said that there's a healing meditation that he can teach them. There's some knowledge they can take back with them. Something that will help them to expand their awareness. Help them to get the most from everyday life. Help them to get the most from their experiences. And the man was interested in this. And so he followed the instructions to sit cross-legged on the floor, close his eyes, take a deep breath, and let all that air out, and take another deep breath, and let all that air out. And then begin to channel some healing, almost like a healing light down through the body. And to breathe in that healing light and breathe out and then breathe in healing light and breathe out. And they continued to do that breathing and were guided to be aware of your shoulders relaxing with each out breath and be aware of the arms relaxing and of the neck relaxing and the face and the head. and aware of the chest relaxing with each out breath aware of the back relaxing and the legs relaxing of that relaxation spreading passing down through the body and as the body relaxes so the mind begins to relax also and being aware of how that mind begins to calm and relax. And they continue to breathe calmly and relax and follow the instructions. And as they continued to do that, they were then guided to begin to expand their awareness from within them first of all paying attention to their inner experience and then allowing that awareness to spread outside of themselves to being fully aware and alert of the sensations of them guiding the man through the experience and then being aware of their environment of where the walls were in the cavern of the water of the movement of the water of the temperature of the water all without actually touching it and then expanding that awareness down through the cavern out to the tree and the forest and the ground and just expanding that awareness further and further and then holding on to that expanded awareness drifting back from the experience while remaining attached to that expanded awareness. 
having a calmness, a calm, hyper-aware state. And they were told that while you're in this state, continue to explore down here. And they remained in this hyper-aware, relaxed state. And they continued to explore. They were going to explore and find their way out, the proper route in. And they explored further down the cavern, where they found a corridor. They followed that corridor until they found some wooden doors. And they opened the wooden doors and found themselves up high in a cliff overlooking forest, looking over treetops for miles to see in all directions. And they followed a path around the side of the cliff, up on top of the cliff, and they looked back and could see even higher now, over treetops. They could see bird of prey flying in the sky. And being in this relaxed, alert, hyper-aware state, they almost felt like they could feel what it's like to be that bird flying. They almost felt like they had a connection with their environment. And they followed the path and they walked away from the top of that cliff, having a sense of the right direction to walk, to cut through this forest back to their campsite. And they cut through the forest being hyper aware of sounds around them in a relaxed awareness state. Almost like they weren't necessarily attaching to anything they were aware of. They were just being in the moment. They weren't actually doing anything. And they found their way back through the forest until they found the clearing, found the lake. And at the lake, they found their way back to their campsite. They had something to eat, rested at their tent. And they started to contemplate and consider the experience they'd had and the meaning of that experience and the surreal nature of the experience. And they were curious about the fellow they met on their journey. And then as the sun began to set, they decided to settle down for the night. And they drifted and floated comfortably, asleep, aware that in the morning they were going to take all their learning with them and journey back to their everyday life, carrying on with their usual routines, bringing back this sense of calmness, of peace, of tranquility this sense of being in the moment, of connection to the world around them, and a sense of finding peace and purpose. 
and they held on to all that, as they drifted and relaxed asleep. And while they drifted and relaxed to sleep, so they began to dream and integrate their learning from their experience camping out here in the forest. The learning of meeting that fellow in the cavern. Their learning from the meditation experience. And they knew they would be able to take all that back with them. That they can use instinctively and automatically in their everyday life. And they drifted and floated into a deep, comfortable, restorative sleep. Okay, so just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I don't know whether you'll relax deeper to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And while you begin to comfortably relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation meditation about a medieval man and this medieval man is living on the edge of a river and they live in a small round property that they built themselves many years earlier and one day they have a dream that sends them on a quest and they wake up that morning feeling a deep sense of purpose. And this dream tells them that they have to head north. And they don't normally head north. They normally spend their time near the river, perhaps sometimes following the river down to the coast. But they rarely go that far north. When they look north off in the distance, they can see mountains. And they often have this sense that they can see the sky so much darker in that direction. Almost like the mountains constantly churn up clouds. And so they prepare themselves for their journey. They pick up what they call their haggis sack, which they sling over a shoulder and they have it hanging down beside them. Inside that sack, they place an object that they've been told in their dream to take north. And then they begin to follow that river, heading northward. And as they set off, they depart the others in this area. And at first the terrain is familiar. The sound of that river flowing down beside them. The sounds of birds. Clouds overhead. The rustling sounds of leaves in the trees. The gentle thud of each footstep on the grass as they go. And they continue to walk as the sun continues to rise and travel across the sky. And they keep that sun behind them and they watch as their shadow 
moves from one side to the other as they continue to walk. And after many hours of walking, they notice that their shadow has moved to a point that lets them know that about half of the day has gone. And they're still following this river. And they're pretty much at the limit of how far in this direction they've ever walked before. And they stop beside the river. And they take a break. They sit down next to the water's edge. They rest their feet in the water. And they allow their feet to be relaxed and soothed by the bubbling, flowing water. As that cool water flows around their feet, through their toes, around their ankles. Bubbling and trickling as it goes. And they sit there, just relaxing. And while relaxing, they have a blade which they use to cut off layers of wood, almost into wooden shavings. And while they're doing that, carving a few arrows. They decide to carve something else. So they take a bit of wood. And just as they're relaxing there, they begin to carve that bit of wood. Into a shape that will be more stable on the water. And they carve out a hollowing in the top of that boat. Then they place some of the shavings into the hollowing. And then they create a mast using some narrow bits of bark almost like string, using some leaves for the sails. And then they make a small fire. And they use that small fire to light those shavings in the boat. And they hold that boat in both hands, close their eyes, can feel and smell that smoke blowing up from the fire towards their face. As they say a prayer and almost make a gesture or an offering for good luck on this journey. And after sincerely making that gesture, they open their eyes, they lean forward, they gently holding that boat with two hands cupped around it, lower that boat into the water, and then release their hands, watch as that boat Bob slightly, sways slightly, as it settles onto the water, before it then gets taken 
by that river and follows the current downstream. Following the current back down in the direction they've travelled from. And they sit back and they watch that boat as it slowly travels downstream. Watching the smoking from inside that boat of those shavings. Aware that the dampness of the leaves used for sails will prevent them from easily catching light as they watch that offering float away. And then after their brief break, they continue their journey. And they stand up. And they carry on following this river. And all they've got for company is their own thought. And they continue to follow this river until eventually the river starts to narrow and calm and then comes out in a small lake and at the top of this lake there's an area where as they look, they can notice some bubbles just rising up to the surface. And they realise that this is where the river begins. This river that helps sustain their home starts here, in this bubbling area. And they grab themselves some water to drink. They fill a container that's hung around them. So they've got some water to take with them. They notice that there isn't that long now until the sun begins to set. And so they decide that now would be a good time to find somewhere to settle down. And as they look around the area, they notice a little way from the water's edge where the grass is longer, almost up to their knees, are the occasional trees, and they notice the most beautiful weeping willow tree. And so they duck down and head towards the centre of that weeping willow tree. And can see the clear space inside that tree, underneath the branches. And they lay down grass that they pull up. to make something comfortable to lay on. And then they relax back on that grass, initially just resting against the trunk of the tree, 
They can hear the wind outside the tree, rustling the leaves of this weeping willow tree. But the weeping willow tree breaks up that wind, meaning that it's relatively calm and still here at the base of the tree. And this specific weeping willow tree hangs all the way down to the ground. And with the tall grass around this area, it shelters from most of the elements, creating an ideal temporary shelter without having to actually make a shelter. And they rest here, sitting against the trunk of the tree. They have something to eat. Before then, settling down onto their grass bed and drifting so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. And as they drift so peacefully and comfortably asleep, they can hear the sounds around them of the evening birds and of other night animals as the night grows deeper and deeper. And the next morning, after a wonderful night's sleep under the willow tree, they leave from under the tree. They have something to eat again. They grab some more water before continuing their journey away from that river, away from that lake, heading towards those mountains. And halfway through the day, they find they've probably made it halfway to the mountains and that they'll probably reach the mountains just as the sun begins to set. And on reaching the mountains, they begin to climb. And as they climb, they notice something curious they've never seen before. that the sun will begin to set and they'll climb quite quickly. But when they then turn and look behind them, they see that it's as if the sun is about to set again. And they can watch for a few moments as that sun begins to set again. But then when they climb a bit higher, and they turn and look, it's as if the sun is about to set again. Almost like climbing is resetting part of the day. And they don't really understand what's going on, but find it a curious experience. And they can see high up in these mountains, looks like a cave. So they continue climbing higher and higher up this side of this mountain, heading up towards that cave, thinking that cave would be a good place to stop, 
to rest and to settle down for a while. And they don't know exactly how far they have to go. They just have this drive that they're supposed to head north and that they'll know when they arrive. And once they reach that cave, they head into the cave. They light a torch. They place that a little way down in the cave. They can hear the wind blowing and echoing into that cave. And the flickering of that flame as that wind blows past. And they relax down. They can feel the coolness up here. They can see over the land. See off in the direction that they came from. They can see the way the river off in the distance. stands out, being illuminated, reflecting that sun's light. And as the sun sets, so they can notice the moon rising, the stars appearing in the sky, the Milky Way arched across the sky. The way the stars twinkle, the stillness that sets into the air. And they drift and float so peacefully, so comfortably asleep. And the next morning they're awoken by the morning sun as it shines into the cave and they make themselves something to eat and then they notice that the way the wind is blowing through the cave makes them think that maybe there's a way through the cave rather than having to climb all the way to the top of these mountains and down the other side, perhaps they can cut through. So they decide that they'll explore in the cave, and that at worst, if there's no way of cutting through, they can just walk straight back out the cave and carry on climbing up and over. but it's worthwhile exploring deeper in the cave. And so they head deeper into the cave. And deep in this cave, they notice that there seems to be a breeze coming up from a point in the floor. And as they brush that point on the floor, brushing the mud aside, they can feel that breeze even more. And they realise that it's as if there's a trap door or some kind of entrance here. And they move that and they see some steps heading down in this cave. As they descend those spiral steps, on step 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, going deeper and deeper under the cave, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, Eight, as the cave gets quieter and quieter, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, finding themselves stood at the base of a new tunnel. And they head away from that spiral staircase. And they can see that off in the distance looks like a little bit of light. And they head towards the light. And when they reach that light, they find that it's an exit from the cave on the other side of this mountain. And that on this side there seems to be steps heading down the mountain in a zigzag pattern, making the route easier to head down this side than it was to climb up the other side. And they start to wonder whether they're following in the footsteps of someone else who perhaps had found that natural cave and then dug their way down and laid this path to make it easier on this side. And they head down those steps. And the mountains are blocking a lot of the sun. And so as they descend, this area is very shaded and cool. And at the top, it's very cloudy. And they descend through the clouds, unsure what the view is beyond. But once they get beneath those clouds, they have the most incredible view of what looks almost like the tops of a large forest. They continue to descend and notice that it's raining on this side. And they head into that forest. And as they pass through the forest, initially so dense that very little of that rain seems to find its way to landing on their head. They can hear the rain on the leaves above them. They can hear that pulsing. Sometimes that rain falls very heavy. And then that almost twinkling sound of the rain falling light and moments of no sound, just the rustling sound of leaves, as that rain calms. And at those points, they also notice the increase in sounds of nature, of birds singing. And as they near the clearing, They decide to make an umbrella out of some of the large leaves near the floor of this forest. And they take those leaves, they stretch them across some wood. They make something they can carry above their head to keep them a bit drier while they walk. And they walk away from that forest until they find the edge of a river. And this river seems to be heading away from the mountains, as if perhaps it had started in the mountains. Maybe the water runs off the mountains flows down and has formed this river. And they feel that it'll take them a while to travel where they're going 
on foot. So they chop down a tree. They then decide that their use of time is better spent, dedicated to carving that tree out into a canoe. So they carve that tree, hollowing out a space for them to sit in, for their bag, for their water, for anything else they wish to carry with them. They carve and shape some wood as a paddle, and then drag their canoe to the edge of the water, hoping that it'll float fine. They drag it into the water. It dips below the water before popping up above the water. And they find that it doesn't seem as stable as they would like. So before they have the whole thing in the water, they have it with its back resting just on the shore to keep it steady and stable while they carve a groove near the front, near the back. They then place two carved branches in those grooves. They use some vines to strap those branches in place, crossing those vines over and over and over again and strapping them tightly in place. And then with a thick branch, they place grooves on that branch. They do the same with that on the other end of those branches. And then they push the boat back fully into the water and find that having that stabilizing branch off to the side helps to keep this boat steady as they now begin to canoe down this river following the current. And they know the general direction they're heading. And they continue to head in that northerly direction. They don't know how far they have to go. Just that they feel this drive to head this direction. And that they'll know when they get there. And that night, they pull that canoe ashore. They make a camp, campfire. They rest by the side of that fire. They have themselves some food. They feel the warmth of that fire. They enjoy the sounds around them, the calmness and stillness to the environment, before drifting and floating asleep. And the next day they continue their journey. And they continue until the river 
opens out into a lake. And once they arrive at that lake, they pull that boat up onto the shore, continue the journey on foot. heading into some more woodland. Before coming out the other side of the woodland in a clearing. And as they come out in this clearing, they see a mound, like a man-made hill. And on that mound they can see a circle of stones. And around the outside of that circle of stones is a circle of small stones. And in the centre is what looks like a shrine. And they have this feeling like this is what they were heading for. It's directly on their path. And as they get nearer and nearer, they feel that sense stronger and stronger. And as they walk up to that shrine, an elderly man with a cane hobbles around the shrine towards them. And they notice that this elderly man appears to be blind. And the elderly man says that you've travelled a long way to be here. But you received the message. And you've got something for the shrine. And the man's unsure how this elderly man could know that. But doesn't even question it. just assumes that somehow they would know. And they take that as a sign that they're definitely in the right place. And this elderly man holds out their hand. And the man reaches into his bag. He pulls out what looks like a smooth egg-shaped stone he places that smooth egg-shaped stone into the elderly man's hand the elderly man turns and walks to the shrine places that stone into a gap in the shrine and the gap is surrounded by symbols and then a purple glow gets given off by that stone and from the symbols and the man backs away a little as the whole shrine and the stones surrounding the shrine begin to glow purple. And then a low purple fog begins to form from the stones from the shrine. Falling down this mound, a slight rumble begins to set in. The blind man backs their way, carefully with their walking stick, 
away from the shrine. And the rumbling increases and the stones start to vibrate. Then the purple light gets brighter and brighter and spreads away from those stones. Then it begins to circle around that man and continues to spread wider and wider. And the man backs away further and further and can see that the elderly man is within the light and can see shapes and shadows forming in the light. And then as that light begins to dim down and calm, as the vibrating calms down and the purple fog dissipates, the man's surprised to see a dragon next to that shrine and resting his hand on the dragon's nose is a healthy, fit-looking young man. And that man then turns, smiling, heads over to the other man and thanks them for what they've done and tells them that their dragon had been captured, transported out of the realm to another realm, and that they live for thousands of years watching over the land, a dragon and a rider, and as a rider, they age, they get older and older and older, but they don't die, so they just get older and older and more and more frail. When they're separated from their dragon, yet when they're together, they both remain young to protect the realm, to protect the land. And that together they're here protecting this land and can now do so again. That when someone reaches a certain age and a new rider needs to be found, a dragon will choose the rider and together they'll protect the land without either aging and that now they're back. They can protect the land against evil. And the man says they've never really noticed much evil. And they're told that that's because of the riders and the dragons. But there's been an evil wizard who had separated them, who had removed his power by trapping the dragon in a different realm from him. And that that wizard has spent hundreds of years plotting, undermining, influencing from the background. And that now they can fight off this evil. And that man and the dragon took off 
and flew away out of sight. And the other man felt that this was a curious experience to have. That he had just taken a stone he had found one day that he thought was curious that washed up on the shore near where he lived. and felt this compelling feeling to travel north. And now with nothing to show for his journey, he has to head home. And so he follows his path back home. Finds his way back to the mountains. Heads through the mountains. heads down the other side and begins to follow that river back to his home. And as he does, he gazes up in the sky and he sees a comet. And the next night, that comet with its tails is still passing across the sky. And he feels this sense that that comet is a sign to say thank you for his help. That there's a battle going on somewhere against evil. And he's done his bit to help in that battle. And he's curious how that presents itself and what's going on and what the outcome will be and why he's lived all this time, never knowing about this. And as he arrives back home, he's pleased to see his home. He's pleased to be back at his own bed. He settles down that night, and gently drifts and floats and falls asleep sleeping so well all night long, knowing he'll awaken, feeling refreshed, revitalised and great in the morning, falling asleep, thinking about and dreaming about his adventure, curious whether it'll see that man and the dragon again, and curious about the adventures of that man and the dragon as he drifts and floats deeply and comfortably asleep. So as you take a moment to close your eyes and begin to relax, you can listen along to the sound of my voice. And as you listen to the sound of my voice, I don't know whether you'll drift off asleep faster to my voice, or perhaps to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I'm just going to tell this guided sleep meditation in the background. One rainy night, there was a woman canoeing down a river through a jungle. She was going in search of treasure. And she could hear that rain on the canoe, hearing the rain on the river. And the weather was quite still, other than that rain pouring down heavily. And she couldn't see that far in front of her. And she was wrapped up dry with just her face poking out of her clothes as she paddled down that river. The sound of the paddles pushing through the water as she continued. 
and it was a dark night here in the jungle. There was no moon to be seen because of the rain clouds. And she could barely make out the shoreline on either side of that river. And she continued to canoe down this river. She had all her equipment in the back of the canoe tucked away dry. And she found that sound of the rain hitting the canoe and hitting the water almost mesmerizing. And she found that rain feeling refreshing. And eventually she felt that she traveled far enough down this river to be able to pull over to the side and set up camp. And so she rode up onto the shore a little bit, got herself out of that canoe, and quickly dragged that canoe into the trees. And the trees were fairly dense. And she could hear the sound of that rain change from raining on the water and the shoreline to that sound of the rain at a slightly higher pitch, raining on the leaves above. And then the occasional dripping sound from the water that's made it through the trees. And she was surprised at how dense this forest was to be able to almost completely stop that rain from reaching the ground here. The rain just seemed to be pouring onto the leaves, finding its way down the branches. And most of the rain that made it to the ground was just running down the trunks of the trees. And she pulled that canoe in among the trees. And the first thing she had to do was set up camp. And she had a tent that she could put up in the trees. She had to attach that tent about six foot up off the ground around one trunk of a tree and then around another trunk and then a third trunk and then she had to place a ground sheet across the supports And then the main tent on top of that. And once that tent was put up, she had a ladder that hung down from the tent. She climbed that ladder. And she'd attached the base tight enough for it to be pretty taut so she could stand on it. She then attached a similar sheet above the tent, just as extra protection for anything perhaps falling down towards the tent. And then hanging down from that upper connection, that upper level, she hung down what was almost like a hanging bucket. And it was at a level that meant that she could sit inside the tent and use that swinging bucket-like item to use a campfire in there that she'd brought with her. 
and there wasn't much rain dripping through, so she didn't have to worry about that being put out or getting too wet. And it had enough weight to it that any movement of the trees meant that it just hung there, level and steady. And she made herself some food and relaxed in that tent. And she could still hear that heavy rain on the leaves above, while she remained dry here in the tent, off the ground. She'd connected her canoe to a tree, just in case that river flooded, so the canoe wouldn't wash away. And after having something to eat, she relaxed back in that tent, And she got the map out for where she had to go. And she analysed that map. She marked on the map how far she had come already down that river. Down to this point. And she took a look at where she needed to go next. That the fastest way was to cut through the forest and she was in search of some ancient ruins, looking for some treasure she expects to find there. And she folded up that map, once she'd looked at where she'll be going in the morning, and she placed it into an old diary that she had with her. And the old diary and the map came together when she acquired them, And she lay back in her tent. And closing her eyes, listening to that rain. On the leaves above. She drifted and floated comfortably asleep. And the next morning, when she awoke. She made herself something to eat before taking down the tent. She'd marked on the map her current location so she knew she could leave that canoe here for now and that she'd make the rest of this journey on foot. The river curves in the opposite direction to where she needs to go. So the only way to get there is to walk through the forest. And so she then continues her journey, walking deeper and deeper into that forest. And she's aware that with the morning, she could hear the sounds of birds in the forest. She could hear the sounds of other animals in the distance and she could tell that the rain had stopped and could notice the occasional shard of light dancing through that forest managing to break through the canopy as the trees gently sway and move in the breeze as she hears the rustling leaves walking deeper and deeper into this forest. And after about half day of trekking, she's been making sure she's kept on track. And now she checks the map to see how much further it looks like she's got to go. And she realises there isn't much further, so she stops for a bit, has something to eat, relaxes by a tree, just resting her back against that tree, eating that food, 
closing her eyes, taking in the environment. Before continuing her journey some more. And as she arrives at her destination, she finds it on the surface to appear a bit underwhelming. She's arrived at some ancient ruins, but the forest has reclaimed this area so well that you can barely notice that something was once here. And she's wondering if where she's looking for is actually here at all. Perhaps the whole thing has been destroyed years ago. Maybe the plants have churned all the mud up, churned this land up so much that what she's looking for may not be where she wants to find it. And she reads some of the diary. Reading some of the diary entries about what she should see here. And things have overgrown significantly since the diary was written. But she has a look around and tries to find anything familiar that matches up with the diary. And she can see a wall that seems to match a drawing in the diary. But just seems to be the remnants of one now. And she's curious why the person who wrote this diary, who previously has found this treasure, had written that the treasure was here, rather than taking the treasure for themselves. And so she goes over to that wall and starts working out her position in relation to that wall. And she'd heard that the treasure was in a temple. But it doesn't look like there's any temple here. So she walks in the direction the temple should be. And after a while, when she's reaching the point where she thinks she should have started seeing the temple, she notices that the ground rises slightly. and realises that the forest has grown right over the top of the temple, has grown into the temple, and almost completely destroyed the temple. And she walks around what used to be the temple, hoping that somehow she can find her way to where the treasure is. And she notices that there's a bit of space between the thick roots of a tree. And she can see through those roots that it looks like there's at least some temple somewhere inside there. So she squeezes through those roots. Gets her torch out. and lights up this narrow space where the roof of the temple has collapsed in under the weight of the forest and the roots have cracked open the stonework and the only thing that stopped it collapsing further is all the tangled roots from all the trees, all the other plants, have created almost a living roof for this area. And she shines her torch around and notices off in a far corner a stone slab and she recognises it from the diary as being the slab that covers 
the entrance to the tunnel that leads to the chamber with the treasure. She goes over to that stone slab. The stone slab is about half her height. And she gets down on the ground, sitting down on the ground, resting her back against the wall, putting her feet up to that stone slab. And she pushes really hard, sliding that stone out the way hearing that stone grind as it slides out the way, revealing an entrance. And the entrance looks like it is perfectly fine, that it's lower than everything else. So nothing here has collapsed. And she lights the way with her torch and starts crawling through that tunnel to the chamber. And she crawls the short distance through that tunnel, and notices how this tunnel seems to be slanted slightly downwards. And it opens out into a chamber, and she drops down into that chamber, and is aware that most of this chamber is below the height of the ground. And so this chamber has remained untouched, unaffected by the forest above. And she realises this chamber was already built underneath the forest. So the forest didn't have to reclaim the space because the forest was already fully grown above this space. And she shines her torch around the walls. And then she sees over at the back of this chamber a stand with a chest on it. And she walks over to that chest. She touches that wooden chest with her hands. She can feel her heart racing slightly faster with the excitement that she's going to open the chest and look inside. And she has a, a moment's pause. She's been searching for this for so long. that she doesn't want this to be over. She's enjoyed the exploration and then she carefully opens that chest and inside the chest she can see the most beautiful golden mask. And she picks that golden mask up out of that chest. and is shocked by how incredibly heavy that mask feels. And she looks at the back of the mask. She puts the mask towards her face. And as she does so, all of a sudden, she sees through the eyes of the mask. and suddenly starts hearing sounds of people around her and realises that somehow looking through the eyes of this mask she's transported back in time to when this ancient civilization were active here and she sees through the eyes of the mask those in the civilization talking about what they're doing, placing the mask in the chest, taking that chest to be placed in the chamber. And they're talking about knowledge to be learned. And they're aware that 
their civilization isn't going to be around much longer. And so they're trying to find ways of passing the knowledge of the civilization on to the future. And they haven't set out to make this mask magical in any way. But somehow it is. And the woman doesn't really understand. But goes with the experience. She wants to know more. Wants to know what happened. Wants to learn. And she sees how this civilization behaved. She sees their rituals. She sees their everyday life. And as she watches all this, so the penny begins to drop. She begins to realize the reason why this mask has been left here. And she takes that mask off, puts it back down in the chest. She has that mask facing her in the chest. She's looking down at that mask. She rests her hands on the chest. And she thinks about what it is that she saw. She starts to think about whether she should take that mask or not. She realises that if she takes that mask, she's going to be doing what it was that led to the end of that ancient civilization. That the ancient civilization wanted to teach something about living in harmony with nature. And about how they had shifted out of harmony with nature. And that that's what had led to the decline in their civilization. That their focus had stopped being on living in harmony. And had started being on gathering wealth for themselves and hanging on to that wealth, and focusing on believing that they own everything, and that they're entitled to everything. And she felt that she probably wouldn't go that way, but she now understood the message of the mask, and the reason why a treasure hunter would come here, find the mask, and leave without it. And the diary never really said why that treasure hunter, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, had come here and left without the treasure. Only that that diary said they had found the treasure, they saw the treasure, it was an incredible sight. They had an incredible experience. And then they put that treasure back. And left the sight. And there was no deeper explanation about what that incredible experience was. But now, this woman felt that she knew what the experience was that the experience was a similar experience to what she had just had, that somehow this mask contained the memories of the past, almost like a recording of the past, to teach others. And to take that mask would be the wrong thing to do. And so she placed that diary in the chest with the mask. She kept hold of the map. She closed the chest. She found her way out of the chamber. She found her way down that corridor. 
out of this temple and started walking away from these ancient ruins. And she headed back the direction she came. And part way back, the sun was setting. So she set up a camp. She spent the night relaxing in that camp, thinking about her experience. Thinking about how she'd enjoyed the journey. She enjoyed discovering treasure, discovering something very few have ever seen. But aware that she did the right thing, in her opinion, to leave it where it was. And she started contemplating the meaning of hunting for treasure that she doesn't really do it out of riches. She doesn't do it to try and find treasure that's going to make her rich. She does it because she wants to discover things, to learn things. And that the knowledge is a much greater treasure than a possession. And she drifts and floats asleep in that tent in the tree. And the next morning, she continues her journey back to the river. She gets to her boat, pushes that canoe out into the river, and it's a clear and sunny day. And that water is so calm and peaceful. And all she can hear as she rows back along the river is the sound of the oars as she finds her way along the river back in the direction she came from back to the hotel near this area back in the direction she came from and she heads home and once home she settles down goes to bed and just drifts and dreams about the experience that she's had about what she'll tell others about the experience and as she drifts and dreams so she just floats and relaxes comfortably asleep just take a moment to Allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my words or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably fall asleep, you can have a sense of a woman out walking one day and she's walking along the edge of a river there's tall grass bees butterflies and other insects flying among wildflowers she can smell the smell from all the different flowers noticing different distinct smells as she passes those different colored flowers catching a scent of certain flowers as a gust of wind blows gently across the meadow and she can hear that flowing water on one side of her as it bubbles and trickles Off the other side of the meadow, she can hear the rustling of the leaves of some nearby woods. She can notice the sounds of birds in the trees. And notice how as she walks along, 
The birds seem to start and stop as if they know her position. That just as she thinks she's getting closer to birds she can hear singing, those birds quieten down. And as they quieten down, so she begins to hear more birds behind her and becomes more aware of the birds she's approaching. But as she continues to approach, so those birds quieten down as if they don't want to reveal their exact location. And she's just calmly walking along the edge of this river. She can smell that slight watery smell in the air. She can notice that freshness, almost as if that water is purifying the air near this river. And she follows that river all the way towards a cliff edge. And near that cliff, she can see out miles around, looking out over a vast vista of trees, meadow, all that wildlife down there. She can see deer. She can see in the distance a fox walking through the tall grass. She can see a hovering bird of prey. And from her vantage point, she's looking down on the top of that hovering bird of prey. And she can hear that river as it tumbles over the edge of the cliff. And down below the cliff, she can see that waterfall. She can see the water spraying up filling a small lake which feeds into narrowing down to be another river continuing that river on and the river seems to be sparkling and shining in the sunlight as it weaves through the landscape off towards the horizon And the sun is just reaching that perfect point in the sky, that golden hour, where it's at just the right angle to illuminate everything with the most beauty. And she sits down near the edge of this cliff and gazes out over that view. And she can feel that comfortable breeze on her skin. She can hear the sounds behind her of the birds in the trees, of that bubbling water, and then of that waterfall down beside her. And she knows that she has to find a way down, and she wants to find a way down before it's dark. But she also wants to just sit a moment, take in the view, take in the most of this light. And after a short while of sitting, relaxing, absorbed in the moment, just looking out over that view, feeling with her fingertips that grass beside her. She stands up. She follows that cliff along away from the river. She heads over towards the trees. 
and the trees end near the top of the cliff. She ties a rope around one of the trunks of a tree. She pulls on that rope, checks that it's secure. And then calmly and comfortably she walks over to the cliff edge. She wraps the rope carefully around her waist in such a way that she can lower herself down gently. She turns with her back to the cliff, holding that rope tight and taut. And she backs up gently and carefully, glancing behind her, checking where she is, holding the rope with one hand behind her back, the rope with the other hand in front of her, carefully feeding that rope around her. And she backs up so that the heels of her feet are over the edge of the cliff. And then she holds her feet steady, knees slightly bent, and very carefully she loosens and feeds that rope through from the back to the front. As she gently, comfortably and confidently tips herself over the edge of that cliff until her back is facing towards the ground. And then she calmly and relaxed, begins to walk down the side of that cliff. And as she descends that cliff, so the sounds from the top of the cliff begin to fade away. And she can hear the increasing sound of that water splashing down at the bottom of the waterfall. She can feel that rope as it passes through her hands, as it moves around her body. She can feel the tension in that rope as she so calmly, so gently lowers herself down and descends and just walks all the way down that cliff. And then when she's about a leg's distance from the bottom, she steps off the cliff with one foot and puts the foot flat on the ground, straightens her body up while lowering the other foot to the ground. and then removes the rope from around her body, loops it up and just places it neatly at the foot of this cliff. And she knows she can always climb back up this way when she returns. And she walks back to the lake and begins to walk around that lake. And she follows the lake round all the way, all the way to where the river continues, the other side of the lake. And the sun now is almost fully set over the horizon. The sky in one direction is dark blue where she can just notice a few of those stars beginning to appear in the sky. The other direction, the shades of oranges, yellows, and a lighter blue as it transitions somewhere in the middle of the sky, with the occasional wispy cloud almost hanging in the sky. and a slight rainbow 
in some of those high up wispy clouds. And as the sun fully sets over the horizon, and all that's left is the orange glow, she stops on that piece of river. She moves a little bit away from the water's edge. Sets up a camp. Lights a fire. Settles down just inside the tent. She can feel the warmth of that fire on her hands, on her cheeks. As she rests, just sitting, just inside that tent. She can hear the river behind the fire. That constant, steady, trickling, bubbling sound. And the fire crackling. The fire occasionally being blasted by little gusts of wind and making stronger sounds before calming again. And as that light dims, so the only light here is the light of the stars and the glow from the fire. And as she gazes at that dancing glow of the fire, she cooks herself something to eat. She can hear the movement of the sides of the tent with each blow of breeze. And she finds the experience, the ambience here, so relaxing. That distant sound of crickets, the occasional chirp of birds settling down for the night in the trees. The occasional sound of flapping wings, of birds just moving around, finding just the perfect place to fall asleep. The occasional splosh in the water, as observant fish pop their faces above the water to nab little bugs out the air before splashing back under the water again. And as the fire relaxes and burns down and just becomes a comfortable glow outside the tent, she backs up into the tent, having eaten her food. And for a little while, she decides just to rest back on a sleeping bag. With the tent open for now, just letting some of that air in. Relaxing for a moment rather than falling straight asleep. Just being able to look out of that tent. Out over that glowing fire and just enjoying the moment. Being able to breathe in that comfortable air from outside the tent. And then after a while, she decides it's time now to sleep. She sits up, zips the front of the tent up, lies back down, snuggles up into her sleeping bag. 
feeling how soft and padded that is. And begins to relax and drift and float comfortably asleep. And as she drifts and floats comfortably asleep, she finds her mind wandering. Finds her mind drifting to a strange world. She's walking down a footpath from her front door, only her front door isn't on her house. It seems to be floating just above the footpath with nothing around it. There just seems to be a grey white in all directions, almost like looking into dense fog with just that door floating there. But she feels so comfortable. And she walks down that footpath to the end of the footpath. She goes to the mailbox at the end of the footpath. She opens that mailbox and finds a letter. And she takes that letter out. And it just has her name written on it, and she opens the envelope and begins to read that letter. And as she begins to read, so she notices that the ink that this is written in seems to sparkle and glow. It seems to be written in almost like a sparkly, glittery, purple ink. And she reads that glistening writing. And it tells her that as you read this, you're going to begin to go on a journey, a journey of inner discovery. And this journey of inner discovery will begin when the horse arrives and not a moment sooner. And the horse won't arrive until it's time. And it's not time yet. You'll know when it's time because the horse will be here. And don't try too hard to work all this out. Because if you try hard to work this out, you'll get lost in thought. You'll go round in wonder. You'll discover curiosity and find yourself losing your place while reading this letter. And while you read this letter, you may wonder about the waffle and whether the waffle is what you're reading, or what you ate for breakfast. And sometimes things can be curious, and sometimes they can get curiouser and curiouser, but you can keep reading, wondering and discovering, because the horse will arrive when it's time. And your journey of discovery will help you to discover harmony. And you'll learn balance and what that means to you. And you can brush up on some skills. All the best, Dan. And she folded the letter up 
and could hear some clipping and clopping down the street. But in every direction she looked was just a grey, foggy look. She placed that letter back in the envelope and put that envelope into a pocket. She had a sense of confusion as a horse appeared, almost glowing and white, out of the fog. As if the only space that exists is the path and a short distance from the path and the mailbox. And this horse has somehow magically just come into existence here. And the horse stops in front of the path. Let's out a breath. She walks over, gently touches the neck of the horse with her hand. She can feel the side of the neck of the horse. She can feel the warmth, the softness, the firmness. That smell of the horse. She climbed onto the horse's back and it began to trot away from the path. And as it did, so the fog began to clear and the path and the mailbox disappeared. And as the fog cleared, she found herself trotting through some woodland on a beautiful spring day. Sounds of birds coming from all directions. Light dancing through the leaves on the path in front of her. The sound of the rustling of the leaves. As she bobbed up and down while the horse trotted through this woodland, And she didn't have any reins and didn't feel that she had any control over the horse. The horse seemed to just know where it was going. And so she just sat on that horse and felt that the experience was so calming, so comfortable and such a beautiful experience, such beautiful environment. She didn't mind not knowing where the horse was going. She didn't mind not understanding what was going on. And as that horse continued, it eventually turned off this path and turned down narrower path. And she followed that narrower path on that horse and she could notice that there was a clearing up ahead and as the horse reached the clearing she could see a cottage and there was someone sitting swinging on a rocking chair outside that cottage Just enjoying, relaxing in this weather. And the most unusual weather vane on top of the cottage and the horse pulled up at the cottage and then stopped. And the woman assumed this is where she had to dismount. So she got off of the horse and walked towards that cottage. And 
and she went over to the person sat outside this cottage who stopped rocking had a beaming smile and gestured for her to sit on the seat opposite so she sat down on the seat opposite And they said that they're going to play a game. And the woman was curious about this game, about why someone would want to play a game. And she got out what looked like a chessboard. Only instead of chess pieces, each piece looked like a different mushroom. There were short, squat mushrooms at the front. There were tall mushrooms at the sides. There was a mushroom that had a bright red top. With some white spots in the middle. And next to that was a tall and slender mushroom that was very similar in colour. And beside that were some small black mushrooms that when you picked them up and looked, had the softest undersides that if you gently tapped them seemed to leave the finest powder on the board. And the woman asked, what are we playing? And the person said that they were playing their version of chess. And so they began. And then this person took one of the small front mushrooms. And instead of just putting it out of play, they ate it. And the woman was confused. And they said, each mushroom you take of the opponent, you eat. There's nothing confusing in that. You're playing with edible pieces. And so the woman carried on playing. And to start with, she felt that she was losing. But then there was something about the experience that helped her to begin to have this sense that she learned the patterns and the play style of her opponent. She'd been paying attention. And now she started winning. But she realized that there was a problem with starting to win. That as you start to win, so you eat more of the opponent's mushrooms. And the more of the opponent's mushrooms she was eating, the more this environment began to change. She first noticed the sky beginning to turn into multiple different colours swirling around, like paint on water. And those colours began to get more and more vivid. And then she noticed as she carried on, that the trees began to pulse and move. 
and that everything began to look almost like she was inside a painting. And eventually she won. But at the point that she'd won, the only thing left that wasn't moving was one space of black and this woman and the horse and the opponent. And so she looked at those things that were stable. And the opponent said, your portal awaits and gestured towards the black hole. And the woman stood up and she worried that with everything moving and twisting and turning, like she's walking through a living painting, that she wouldn't be able to walk steady but as she started taking steps, so she found that she could walk steady perfectly fine. And she walked into that black hole and discovered that it was a long tunnel, almost like a deep cave inside a painting. And as she walked in, it got darker and darker. And then after a while, as her eyes began to adjust, she noticed a slight glow. She could hear a slight dripping. And it was a slight, almost like an electric blue glow. And she walked towards that electric blue glow and found the softest, most incredible looking moss. She reached down, touched it with her fingertips, could feel that damp, soft carpet of moss that seemed to be glowing with a slight electric blue glow. And she gathered up a large handful of that moss. And she used that moss as a way of lighting her way while she continued her journey through this tunnel. And this moss in her hand gave a soft, comfortable blue glow to the sides of the cave, lighting it just enough for her to find her way through. And as she walked along, she saw what looked like a damp piece of wood lying on the ground, almost like a plank just lying there. And she only saw it because the glow from the moss illuminated the damp surface on that wood. And she walked comfortably across that plank to the other side. And she could see in the distance a light, just the tiniest light of the exit of this tunnel, the exit of this cave. She could feel the coolness, the calmness in this cave. And then she saw a sign that just said, perception is everything. And then there was a space. And then it said, turn around. And she turned around. And she saw that from this angle, that that plank 
was over an incredibly deep drop. And she stepped back slightly. And she looked down at that drop. And she realized that she walked across that plank perfectly fine. But was unsure whether she would be able to walk back across that plank. Now she knows there's a massive drop beneath it. And she understood the sign. And she turned around and carried on. And as she reached the exit of the cave, she placed that moss down, wiped her hands on her legs to dry them off, and headed out into the sunlight. And as she headed out into the sunlight, She was surprised to see a beautiful valley, distant mountains. She could see the snow on the top of those mountains. She could see the way clouds were bashing into the mountains and rising up, being stopped by those mountains. And she wondered where she was. She could see down there in this valley a herd of zebra. She could see a pool of water and wild animals gathered around that pool drinking and then walking away to carry on their own journeys and when the time was right she walked down to that pool of water herself and when she got down to that water she had a drink of some of that water. And she looked around herself. And she was aware of how solid everything was here. How real everything was here. Compared to where she walked in. And as she was drinking that water, so she could feel the warmth of the water. And so she decided to go in that water for a little swim. She almost just felt a compulsion to take this moment to relax. And she walked into that water up to her waist and then lowered herself into the warm water and pushed herself through the water, turned onto her back and just floated on that water. And she could feel the warmth of the sun on her face. And as she felt that warmth of the sun. So she allowed her eyes to close. And while she floated there, she felt almost like she was just floating in space. Floating weightless, resting on that water. And while she rested there, floating on the water, she wondered what all this meant. 
what the purpose of this journey has been. She's aware that she's dreaming, but it's curious what her mind is trying to teach her about harmony, healing, about balance, and how this all relates to her real life journey. And then after a while of resting there, she hears the gentle, very distant rumble of thunder. So she takes time to swim back to the shore. She can see that the storms way off in the distance, over near the mountains, But where she is, it's still sunny. And she sits there for a while, drying off in the sun. Wondering why she's been led to here. And after drying off in the sun, she looks around herself. See if there's any clues. And she sees off in the distance, near the trees, something glistening. She walks over to that location. And at that location, she has this sense of something talking to her, almost talking straight to her mind, telling her to open the small box that's by the tree. And it's the stones on the box that are glistening in the light. And so she reaches down, lifts the lid on that box. And inside the box, she finds what looks like just a simple stone. There doesn't seem to be anything particularly special about it other than its softness. Almost like it's been polished and looked after and wrapped around that stone is a piece of red material tied into a bow and tucked into that bow is a rolled up thin piece of paper and so she opens the bow She gets that paper, she opens the paper, she reads what it says on that paper, it just says, my gift to you, keep this on you, always, and she doesn't know whether it actually is a gift to her or not. But no one else has received this. No one else has been here. And her experience has led her here. So she takes that stone, puts it in her pocket, puts everything else back in the box and closes the lid. And as she closes the lid, So everything around her begins to turn white again. Almost like a fog has set in around her again. 
and she finds herself stood on a path next to the mailbox. She turns around and can see her floating front door. She wonders whether she's supposed to walk inside. And she walks towards that door. Reaches the door handle. Opens the door. And everything just looks dark the other side of the door. But she steps through that door. And as she does, she becomes aware of the sound of rain on the tent. And aware that she's in that half asleep, half awake state in the tent. Just feeling so deeply relaxed, listening to that rain. And then she hears the occasional chirping of a bird. And she hasn't opened her eyes yet. She just listens. And she wonders whether perhaps morning is approaching. And because she hasn't opened her eyes. And she's still drifting in her mind in a half awake, half asleep state. She doesn't notice how much time has passed when she becomes aware that there's a slight glow coming through the tent, that it's getting lighter and lighter outside the tent. And then she hears that the rain has passed. She exits the tent to the most beautiful morning. She can smell that smell, that it's rained on the grass, that it's rained after hot, sunny weather. She stretches, takes some deep breaths of the fresh air, She has a drink of some water, has some food before carrying on her journey, and then notices in her pocket is a stone, and she looks at that stone and feels the stone, and wonders how it got there, because the stone matches the stone in her dream. And she packs her tent away, carrying on her journey. And while she's walking along, she's continuing to wonder about that stone. Wondering how it got there from her dream. Wondering whether, perhaps, she'd picked it up and got no memory of it the day before whether maybe it fell in her pocket at some point. And as she continues her journey, she can see some magpies flying up into the sky from the meadow. is the sound of a distant crow. You can hear the sounds of robins and songbirds in the trees. Watches the butterflies, the bees. And finds the whole experience deeply relaxing. And yet a part of her mind keeps coming back to wondering about the stone. 
and she keeps handling that stone, taking the stone out of her pocket, walking along while she's looking at the stone, feeling its softness in her fingertips, and wondering about the experience that she'd had in her dream. And she keeps telling herself the two aren't connected, that the stone must have got in her pocket some other way. And as she reaches her destination, she decides to let it go. And she puts the stone in her pocket and decides to keep it anyway. Something to remember her trip by. And at her destination, she sets up a camera and it's the most beautiful valley location mountains off in the distance and she's trekked all the way here to get a photo of tonight's lunar eclipse she knows that at the point the lunar eclipse happens. The moon will be perfectly positioned between two of the mountains. And she's hoping that with the right exposure, she can get some photos, perhaps having the eclipse mirrored in the river. And even if it isn't, she's hoping to get a whole range of photos of the night and of that eclipse. And from this location, she can zoom in to make it so that that moon looks so much larger in the image compared to the foreground. And she knows that part way up the mountains there are still trees and for part of the eclipse the moon will begin to go behind those trees and zooming right in will make it look like a really large moon next to those trees and she's been planning this for a long time. And once she set her camera up on the location the moon will be. And she knows she'll take other photos. She then sets her tent up. And she doesn't do a campfire. She doesn't want the additional light. And as the sun sets. She begins to get some photos of the way the light shifts and changes and how that changes the environment. How things look different when they're illuminated blue to when they're illuminated oranges and reds to when everything's just dark. And then when the moon is illuminating everything with a silvery light. And then she takes photos. As the earth's shadow gently moves across the moon. First barely noticing. And then gradually taking more and more of a bite out of that moon. Until eventually there's just the thinnest slither of silvery moonlight left. And then the moon begins to glow red. And as that red moon hangs in the sky, 
she continues taking photos. And there's about 20 minutes when the moon is totally red. And she tries multiple different exposures, getting as many photos as she can. Feeling a sense of wonder, of calmness, of excitement at what she's doing. And then zooms in on the moon to get the photos as the moon begins to set behind one of the mountains. Getting the photos of the trees in front of the moon. And that setting moon carries on for some time as the eclipse carries on. And a silver slither of moon appears again growing larger and larger until when half the moon is uncovered the covered half the moon is behind the mountain and so now all she can do is keep taking photos of that moon as it disappears from view And once the moon is out of sight, and the night's sky is plunged into even more darkness, she zooms back out and starts taking photos of the stars, taking multiple photos of the night sky. And despite it getting later and later, there's something about the experience that helps her feel so deeply relaxed and at one with nature and in awe of the scale of the world around her. And of all the effort she went to, the trekking, abseiling and travelling all the way here where the only way to reach here is on foot. And all the months of planning to try and find the perfect location for the photos that she wanted to take. And now she's got those photos. And after many, many hours, She takes her camera into the tent, zips up the tent as the air begins to cool and she settles down in the tent, looking through the photos that she's taken, before settling down and falling asleep. And the next morning she awakens, feeling full of energy, feeling so refreshed. And she begins her journey back the way she came. She hikes all the way back to where she camped the previous day. She realises that she might be able to make it all the way in one journey all in one day. She hikes to where she abseiled and she pulls on that rope, tests the strength of that rope and then walks up that cliff and decides that it's easier to have come down the cliff than to be pulling yourself back up the cliff. And at the top, she unties her rope, gathers her rope up, puts that into her backpack, carries on her journey back to her car. 
and it's beginning to get late. So she decides to have a short break, just sleeping in her car for a moment, just a couple of hours, to recharge, refresh, to revitalize. She rests back in the car seat, in the comfort of that car. And while she's sleeping, so it begins to rain lightly. And she can hear that rain on the windscreen, on the roof of the car. And she finds that that rain sound on the car is making it harder for her to want to wake up. She's wanting to relax even deeper into the experience. And so she ends up sleeping longer than expected. But when she awakens, she feels so refreshed and ready for a drive home. And it's still raining slightly, so as she drives home, she's got the window wound down a little. She can smell the rainy air outside the car. She can hear the sound of that rain on the car, on the road. The windscreen wipers moving left and right, left and right. The sound of the windscreen wipers motor moving left and right. And she carries on driving home. And as she nears her home, so she enters a more built up area. You can see the way the overhead street lights have their light reflecting on the car, almost like beams of light moving along the car, passing over the car as the car moves. The sound of the tires on the wet road. Finding the whole driving experience so relaxing and calming and looking forward to arriving home. And on arrival home, she heads indoors. And she sees a large parcel has been delivered for her. And on the parcel is a letter. And she opens that letter and sees that this letter says it's for her eyes only. And she reads that letter, folds that letter up, puts it back in the envelope, unwraps the item. And as she unwraps the item, she realizes that it's a painting It's a painting of the most beautiful landscape with a cave through a cliff and she recognizes it as the swirly painting looking place that she'd visited in her dream and instinctively then puts her hand in her pocket and feels that stone. And then here's a voice saying that someone's always watching over you. Someone's always there for you. Even when you think there's no one there for you. Whether you interpret that as something external to you or just your inner guidance, there's always that voice that picks you up that tells you you can do it, that reaches out a hand to you, 
that smiles at you when you need it. That joins you on your journey. That's there for you, supporting you. That will motivate you. And tell you, you can do this. Keep going. And somehow she understands this and understands this voice. And she places that painting above the fireplace. She sits down in a chair, gazing over at that painting. She then hears this sound from another room of her daughter practicing the harp. She closes her eyes, listening to that gentle music in the background. And sitting in that seat with her eyes closed, listening to that music, she suddenly feels a sense of deep peace and relaxation and decides to go to bed. She says good night to her daughter, tells her daughter how lovely the playing is, how proud she is of her daughter. Now she looks forward to hearing more tomorrow. She heads to bed, gets into bed, puts that stone down next to the light on her bedside table. And drifts and floats, so comfortably asleep, knowing she'll awaken in the morning feeling so full of energy, feeling revitalized, knowing that overnight her mind will have gone through its own healing process of psychologically healing and her body will go through its process of physically healing so that she can awaken in the morning feeling refreshed and ready to carry on with the day. And as she drifts and floats asleep, she begins to drift into the most pleasant, most wonderful dreams of healing, of well-being, of pleasure and excitement and happiness, and drifts asleep with a smile on her face, sleeping and relaxing through the night. So take a moment to close your eyes as you listen to me. And as you listen to me and you begin to fall asleep, I'm going to tell you a story in the background. And so with your eyes closed as you drift comfortably asleep, You can have a sense of somebody who was going about everyday life. They'd wake up, go through their life, going to work, being polite to others, going home, watching some TV, going to bed, getting up, going to work, being polite to others going home, watching some TV and going to bed. And every day this was their routine. They'd wake up, go to work, 
go home, watch TV, go to bed. And then one day they woke up and they thought to themselves that they didn't want to keep doing this. They wished there was something more exciting in life. Because when they were thinking back over their past, only a few memories stood out. Most of the memories just blurred into one. They couldn't tell one day from the next. Just getting up, going to work, going home, watching TV and then going to bed. So one day while they're at home, they decided to go on the internet and just randomly book a holiday, a trip anywhere at all, they didn't know where, they just wanted to book something. And they booked a holiday to an exotic location. And all of a sudden, while they were going to work, they'd be thinking about the excitement of this trip away they've got coming up in the future. While they're at work working and smiling politely, in their mind they were thinking about what this exotic location will be like. On their journey home, they're thinking about that holiday they're planning on going on and looking forward to it. And every day they crossed off a date on the diary as they got closer and closer to their trip. And then the holiday came around, they travelled to that exotic location. Plane landed, and they went to the hotel, and they left their stuff in the hotel. They decided to go out exploring. And so they went out exploring. They wandered out into a beautiful rainforest. The sounds of the birds, rustling of the leaves, sounds of monkeys in the distance, and all the other sounds. And they could feel how warm it was in the rainforest. But their attention was just so focused on the excitement and the exploration. They could hear water in the distance. And so they pushed through the rainforest. And the sound of the water got louder and louder. And they continued pushing through the rainforest, excited, wondering what they would find. And the sound of the water got louder and louder. Until eventually they found a clearing. Suddenly, there was the light from the sun beating down on them and glistening on water on a giant lake surrounded by huge waterfalls. And they could see those huge waterfalls and the spray and the mist coming up at the bottom of the waterfalls. And rainbows dancing in the water. 
as it spray up above the lake. And they saw what looked like a small wooden boat down on the lake. They walked down to that boat, climbed into the boat, picked up the oars, pushed off the side, and gently paddled out into the lake. And they could feel the force of the water against the oars as they paddled. And they paddled out towards the centre of the lake. And the lake was calm. With just those waterfalls around the outside. But the water seemed to quickly calm. as it moved away from the waterfalls. And the lake appeared to be very deep. And the person just pulled the oars into the boat. They put their backpack down to use as a pillow. And they lied back in that boat and just Closed their eyes and relaxed, listening to the waterfalls in the background, smelling the fresh water air, feeling just the most subtle rocking of the boat on the lake and feeling the warmth of the sun beating down on them. And they just closed their eyes, took some deep breaths and relaxed, and just allowed themselves to become absorbed in the moment. And as they relaxed and became absorbed in the moment, the sun continued its journey across the sky. Gradually lowering in the sky. And the sounds in the forest began to change. From daytime sounds to nighttime sounds. And as the sun set, so the person opened their eyes and gazed up into the sky. And as they gazed up into the sky, they could see a blanket of stars twinkling in different colours in the sky, different clouds. And they could see the Milky Way stretching across the sky. And they recognised one point of light in the sky as being Mars. And as they gazed at that point of light, as they gazed up at Mars, so their eyes began to close again. 
and as their eyes began to close, they discovered their eyes opening on the red planet. And oddly, they didn't have any space gear on. And they were able to breathe perfectly fine. As if they were just on Earth. But they knew they were on the red planet. And they discovered themselves at the foot of a mountain range on Mars. And they thought, wouldn't it be exciting to climb a mountain range on Mars? So they climbed up the mountain. They trekked up the mountain. And as they approached the top of the mountain, they noticed how vibrant the red was. they began to get a new perspective on this world. And they sat down and they enjoyed the view, knowing they were the first person ever to set foot here. And as the small sun set on Mars, so they could see two small moons in the sky, and all the stars in the sky, and they could see off in the distance, pale blue dot, they knew was Earth. And they enjoyed the awe, the wonder of gazing at that pale blue dot, seeing that all life on earth, all known life in the universe is on that pale blue dot. And suddenly, they had a sense that life seems so fragile when it's all contained in that one location, in such a small location from this distance. And they felt a sense of love and compassion for all that life. And a sense of the importance for looking after that pale blue dot. And as the sun rose on another Martian day, so with these new learnings they climbed down the mountain. And as they reached the base of the mountain, so they found their eyes opening in a boat floating on a lake, listening to that water, feeling the warmth of the morning sun. And they got the oars and they rowed back to shore. 
and they continued exploring for a while in the rainforest. And that evening they decided to pitch up a tent to camp in the rainforest. And it was a tent that you pitched up between the trees that would tie to the trees and be held a few feet off the ground. And then you'd climb up into the tent and you'd be a few feet off the ground. And you'd feel like you were floating. And as they relax in the tent, feeling comfortable and calm, so they would notice how the tent sways gently between the trees, almost like being rocked gently asleep. And they did rock gently asleep in the tent. And after a week or so of enjoying an exotic holiday, seeing colourful birds, seeing different apes, and other animals, taking plenty of photographs and writing down thoughts that came to mind. They travelled back home and they appreciated their own bed. more than they had appreciated it in a long time. And they knew they had to do this more often. As they relaxed down in their bed and drifted comfortably and deeply asleep. 